into the Truth Seeker Podcast. Argos! Psychic! Everything's ungodly! Dark Savage! Streaming live at TruthSeeker.com. She's not a Christian! Give it up, y'all. Your portal to the paranormal, esoteric, and all things spiritual. She's tampering in Dark Savage stuff! And now, your host, Truth Seeker. Yo, what's up, ladies and gentlemen? I'm your host, Truth Seeker. This is the Truth Seeker Podcast. I'm excited, delighted to be with you guys again for another amazing episode. We're going to go deep. We're going to be talking about spirituality. We're going to be talking about something that's near and dear to many of your hearts out there is psychedelics and the Bible. Are are they in the Bible? Um, a lot of different um, opinions. We've had some really cool guests on the show talking about the similarities and some obscure verses and some things like that, but we're going to get deep, man. So that they definitely have a special place in my heart. And uh, we're going to talk about that today. I want to say a huge thank you to everybody supporting my work via Patreon. This is a listener supported listener funded show doesn't exist without your help. So thank you guys from the bottom of my heart for uh, partnering with me, believing in the vision, co-creating and helping me bring this thing to the table financially. Uh, the bigger we get and the more uh, things that we add to the table here, uh, the more that it costs. And so there's a lot of things that we want to do and uh, we can't do the, do it without your help. So thank you for believing in the work, co-creating and partnering with me. It means the world. Uh, shout out to some of the latest patrons within the last week. Shout out to uh, Lena. Thank you for coming on Lena as well as Fox. Thank you, guys. If you'd like to support, go to patreon.com backslash truthseeker to get access. Um, that Patreon is merging with and taking the place of essentially um, this new platform that we're building where I can bring more people on. And so it is the Mystic Circle. The website is themysticcircle.net. It's had all of my time and all of my attention in the last three weeks or so. And so there's been so much going into that. We just kind of uh, started it where now we're able to do chat features and chat functioning, chat rooms and all that kind of stuff. Direct messaging uh, set up kind of like a Facebook for mystics and for people who are into the uh, spiritual and esoteric and those kind of things. And so we got a lot more people coming on. Uh, most of you seen that I had a really good talk with Dell the other day on the podcast and we, we hit it off really good. And so I'm talking to him and his wife about coming on and they're super excited about bringing their content to the platform as well. So they have courses and a bunch of other material that they're going to be putting there too. I've got courses that I'm working on. All that stuff's going to be available at the mystic circle.net. Um, I started my Sunday morning breath work. We did our first session. Uh, this past Sunday and it was beautiful amazing we went in really deep and uh, and that's recorded too so those of you who weren't able to make it you'll get access to all of the archives of that kind of stuff too that's available we're also going to be launching another podcast out of the mystic circle which is the mystic circle podcast and that's going to be the round table discussions from some of the creators that uh, we're bringing on to that hub as well something that I've been wanting to do for a good while now we have a uh, you know a lot of like-minded people in the community and so to to hear their voice and give them a platform has been something that um, I've been doing since the beginning and so this is something uh, official moving forward in 2021 so go check it out look at everything that we have going on there the mystic circle dot net we've got events webinars um conferences a bunch of really cool stuff planned for you there's going to be live streams public and private throughout the week a bunch of really cool uh stuff check it out the mystic circle dot net um to let you know too we have some um stuff coming up i've got some events the events that i have coming on that are going to be physical in person i have a concert coming up the concert i believe is march the 20th in Mobile, Alabama. All of that info is at truthseeker.com for those of you who want to see me uh, in a small intimate setting at a concert. And, and so we're doing that. And the last time we did one there, 
uh, on a bigger scale for um, my album release party in 2018, people drove from all over the country. Blew my mind. Literally. It was in Mobile. Had people drive like 14 hours, 8 hours, 9 hours. That was like insane to see people from all over the country drive to a house show to see me perform for the album release party. That's when I knew that the podcast was reaching a, a larger audience and I, I had tapped into something a lot bigger than myself. And so we're doing it again, March the 20th. Um, also, we're doing another retreat. The retreats have been amazing. We're going to be doing cacao ceremonies and yoga and uh, breath work and all that cool stuff. If you want to spend the day with us there, that is going to be May the 1st. There's only a few tickets available because it's a small intimate setting as well. Um, go get tickets at truthseeker.com. Um, if my guest is ready, I know he was getting some things ready. Harry, are you with us, man? Uh, yes, I'm with you. I'm just setting up my camera. So thank God the timing as well. Awesome. 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 So my guest today is Harry Rosenberg, Rabbi Harry Rosenberg. And so, uh, been checking out some of his videos and, um, he hit me up you know, wanting to do a talk and wanting to come on and, and share some of his research. And, and there's a lot of it that, that you're bringing to the table. That's right up my alley for, with my experiences and my studies and uh, really like what you're doing, man, really open-minded, enjoy your conversations, your studies, your courses, all that stuff. So um, let me know when you're ready, bro, and turn your camera on and, and I'll get you to introduce yourself and we'll, we'll start there. Perfect. So what I'm going to do right now is right now I'm connected through my phone. I'm just going to open up my laptop link. So I'm going to re ask to enter the zoom and you'll just re-allow me. So I'm gotcha. going to do a quick leave and a quick re-enter if that's okay. Great, 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 great. Perfect. I'm coming right back. Yes, sir. Make it happen, guys. Technical difficulties, get in where you fit in. It's uh, it happens. So he's get, he's getting in now. He was literally in his car, uh, walking into his place. So, uh, we're going to make it happen. So versus canceling or rescheduling, we're going to do it. Um, a lot, lot of cool stuff to ask this brother, and we're going to go deep, so buckle up. All right, there he is. Waiting for him to unmute. There he is. <laughs> How we doing? Hey, there we are, Rabbi Harry. Man, welcome to the podcast, bro. Thank you. I really appreciate you having me on. You guys sound like you're talking about great things that need to be talked about. Yeah, you too. And so it's the meaning of the minds. Yeah, it's the human conversation for thousands of years. We're just kicking the can down the road. But we have more information than before, so we're able to you know, build a bigger puzzle piece, I guess. Everybody has a piece of it for sure. And I think that, uh, you know, coming together for these talks helps us to get to the bottom and, and, and see, see the bigger picture, you know. Um, for those who don't know who you are, uh, just give an introduction of what you do, what you bring to the table. We'll start there. Okay, great. So my name is Harry Rosenberg, originally from Queens, New York. And I think I'm a convergence of many different areas of life. I grew up just a regular New Yorker, so I'm glad I had that experience, uh, you know, for what it was worth. But at a later age in my life, I found uh, both, I don't know if it was simultaneous or not, the power of plant medicine and my ancestral, um, people call it religion, but I look at it as a much different way um, because I'm, you know, I'm a Jewish rabbi now. And I learned about the, the blockchain style of information that has been passed down for 2,600 years. So I was just like, wait a minute, did King Solomon write down books? Like, what's going on there? Let me, let me see what he's talking about. And then applying my New York upbringing and my plant medicine history with like the works of King Solomon and the sages for 2000 years to follow, I feel like I was able to mine different information that wasn't being mined out and share it with the world from a unique perspective. So the topics I got involved in mostly were the prophecies of the lost tribes of Israel. If anyone knows what a Jew is, they've heard the name, you know, there's a lot of good things you could say, a lot of bad things you may say. I love to talk about them all and get heavy, take the gloves off. But a Jew really is just one small piece of the ancient people of Israel. The majority of the nation went missing into Africa and across the Silk Road. So I go in through what's going on there, what's the prophecies, what's the timeline for these prophecies, what happens in the end of days. So that's stuff I studied. And uh, as well as I studied the biblical narrative and I was able to 
really understand how intimately tied plant medicine is with the, the biblical narrative and the ancient tribes. So those are the two areas I focused on. I now live in Israel and I got a farm to go off grid and build my own little eco village, which I hope one day works. And in the meanwhile, I'm just trying to stay humble and learn. That's it. Stay humble and learn. It's good stuff. Um, I guess for some perspective, we have a lot of Christian uh, Christians on, you know what I'm saying? But they're into plant medicine. They're into the metaphysical. What is your take on like the New Testament and, G and the Jesus figure and, and that stuff just moving forward? Well, I love the question. It's a charged question. Um, I have a lot of opinions that may ruffle feathers, but I, I'm always happy to be challenged back because I think intellectual conversation should never become emotional. Let's just talk it out and see what's true. So I'm going to say what I think is true from my perspective, but by all means, that may not be what's universally true. So I'm happy to hear other perspectives. But from my perspective, there's two things going on. One is from the Kabbalistic, the secret of Judaism's point of view, what purpose Christianity has served and the whole Jesus story, what, what role it plays in the grand scheme of reality. That's one thing we could discuss. But the second, the second thing we could discuss is, you know, the integrity of the New Testament I have issues with just off the fact of how many versions and redactions and edits there were to it. So when it comes to, you know, and I mentioned the word blockchain before, and for your list, I'm sure many of your listeners, because they seem woke, they know what the blockchain may or may not be, but just very briefly, the blockchain is peer reviewed information that everyone in the world agrees happened. And then that transaction of whether it's a Bitcoin or something else gets stored because the whole world agreed that it happened. And so the way Torah works and Judaism works is every generation, there is some sort, of, some sort of universal stamping that this information we are passing down. And it's what Moses told his children, to his children, to his children. And if someone tries to submit information on that transmission that wasn't what everyone else was saying, it would get left off and not make it to the next generation. So when it comes to the information I have, I will always tell you, this is when it was written. This is, you know, who wrote it, the bio, and it was unchanged for 2000 years. But with the New Testament, you see the Council of Nicaea, you see, you know, hundreds of years after G and, you know, my personal opinion about Jesus, he was a plant medicine healer based on what I've understood about ancient Greek culture and the special wine he was passing around and the chemicals that would have been used. Let's discuss that in a little bit. But whatever he was or wasn't, we don't have that full story It was the Council of Nicaea a bunch of Roman, Greek, Latin speaking people put their pagan version over the whole story. They overlaid it. So, you know, it's very difficult for me when someone says, you know, the spirit, the father, the Holy Ghost, these things are all pagan Latin stuff that was not part of the original Jesus narrative. So I would love to know, you know, when someone says, I believe in Jesus in the New Testament, I'm like, there's 3000 versions. Which one are you talking about? So that's mm -hmm. my first question. But uh, yeah, I did do studying recently. There was someone on Joe Rogan's podcast named Brian. His last name is a little tricky, Murasaku, I believe. Um, and he was speaking about the ancient psychedelic gurus of ancient Greek. And, um, and those times, they just did an after school 15 minute episode about it. it was fascinating. But he basically proves without a shadow of a doubt that the, the, the basis of ancient Greek culture and mythology was psychedelic ceremonies. And, and he showed the nature of how they spoke about it, described it, and defined it was word for word what Jesus said, basically, he had. Someone could offer atonement and, re, and to give you an opportunity to get reborn through drinking his wine. Yeah. I mean, that was, that was a sacrament that literally brought you to that death and rebirth experience, which cultures around the world are searching after. So when someone says he's like into Jesus, I'm like, oh, so you mean you're into the fact that he was a shaman walking around trying to help heal people? That makes sense to me. But if someone says I'm into Jesus because he's the son of God or he's a God, I'm like, wait a minute, that sounds a little pagan. Let's go into the scripture now and show me wh why you believe that, you know, without someone having told it to you. Like, how do you know? Where do you believe that? Yeah. So that's just my personal opinions on the matter. But from the Kabbalistic point of view, Christianity plays a very serious role in history as far as a place where the light of the redemption somehow was stored in this shell for a future time where it's going to come out. Because, mm -hmm. you know, if you look at it, you have billions of people talking about King David and the Messiah that comes from him. This is, you know, the legends of Moses now scaled to billions of people around the world. So something's going on there. But it, <clears throat> at the end, I'll say all thing, I'll say something that's really clear and meaningful is as a Jew, we're not allowed to believe someone is the Messiah until he does three basic things. 
So I don't care if you're levitating, healing people, blind, none of that makes a difference. There's three specific things the Messiah of Israel has to do. One, he's got to bring world peace. Two, he's got to unite the tribes of Israel across the world, which is not the Jewish people again. That's, that's people all the way across the Silk Road to Japan and to Africa and to the islands. And three, he has to build a temple in Jerusalem for all humans to come and pray and worship. And right now that doesn't exist. So, and those three things I said are based off scripture. There's scripture to say these are the functionalities of the Messiah. So I'm totally not into speculating or getting my hopes up. Whoever the Messiah is, obviously I'll be on his team because it will mean that there's a time of world peace, temple in Jerusalem for everyone, and the United House of Israel. So we don't get excited or emotional until those three things happen. Until then, we have faith in the creator of the universe, and we pray to him for salvation, peace, love, and mercy. Awesome. Sounds good, man. Those are those are some really uh, um, valid points, bro. And so I just wanted to get your just perspective on it moving forward, um, just for context to know where we can go and, you know, just kind of setting it up. Um, yeah. Because I want to ask you about the New Testament and just something that you mentioned, too, about the blood and the wine just starting there. Like, uh, I, I just find it really interesting when we're talking about psychedelics and the fact of, of this journey that when you partake of, let's say, psilocybin or, or um, whether it's a DMT or ayahuasca or something like that, but definitely psilocybin for me, the mushroom uh, cults, I guess you would say, of, uh, of antiquity. Um, there's a journey that you go on and the things that you've been kind of like suppressing or not dealing with, they come up. And I think that uh, in the spiritual community and, and, and that's tied into a religious community, right, of, of the people who were uh, warriors of virtue and, and just doing the inner work and that kind of thing, this uh, inner um, alchemical work, if you will, that happens, you know, through religion, through reading the scriptures, contemplation, you know, for for those who are like initiated on that mystical path, I would say, not just for the broad spectrum of religion in general. But when you partake of psilocybin, um, you you have to deal with the shadow self the things that you don't like about yourself, your shortcomings, and it kind of gives you an objective take on it. Um, and it's usually like a, a, a beautiful one, but if you don't deal with it, it can it can bring up some very traumatic experiences. And so reading the text that talks about um, when they would partake of the bread and wine, and so those who would partake of it uh, who weren't worthy, who like haven't done like the inner work to, to receive communion, um, then they would drink damnation upon their themselves. And it said that that's why there were many sick among you. And so, you know, coming from a religious perspective, we know people take communion all over. There's unbelievers going to church, taking communion. There's all kinds of things. And nobody's like really getting sick. Nobody's, you know, drinking damnation upon themselves and they're not sick after they take it. But when it comes to psilocybin, the person who hasn't done the inner work, the person who has stuff that they're hiding and they haven't come to terms with, that kind of like sends them on this journey of what we'll call like a bad trip or bad experience. And so I've had a couple of people on, we've talked about it, but it's been something that makes sense. Not saying that it was, but so you, you think that there's a possibility um, for, for some of those people uh, in the past that, that the uh, um, Eucharist could have been plant medicines. Yeah. First of all, I just want to take a second to appreciate your question. That was, that was a nice question. Um, for, I just want to preface an uh, interesting fact that the word for mushroom in Hebrew is petria, and the root word of that is peter, uh, like P-T-R, those three letters in Hebrew, which is the same root word for the womb and for the word death. So the same word for womb, death, is the same word for mushroom in Hebrew. Just an interesting thing to note. Uh, I don't know, you know, how, what that means or what it doesn't mean, but the Hebrew language is very coded, so things always lead to each other. Um, there's also a story in the Talmud, which is a collection of, you know, legal cases and secrets of the ancient Kabbalah, where it says that in the Temple of Jerusalem, you had the priests, King Solomon's Temple. And in the priestlyhood clan of the temple, they would eat something called the showbread. It was a special yeah. bread that they made in the temple. But in the Talmud, it says, that, and first of all, you know, everyone ate about, let's say, this size, like a little teeny quarter size. You know, it was like a little bite. You didn't have a slice of bread. You had a little teeny ball of it rolled up. 
And it said that the earlier generations were able to have like a bigger dose and the later generations were too weak of mind. So they couldn't handle the size that the earlier generations, and I'm talking about the a quarter size. So they had to like either pa pass on it or tone it down. So I'm like, you know, I could have like 10 slices of bread if I'm hungry. Like what's going on here? These guys can't have like a quarter size of bread. And so, you know, there's there's a lot of theory to say that the that the showbread was based off some type of recipe of the mana from the desert, which people speculate had an ergot LSD type chemical to it. Because um, we know ergot could be a very good replacement for what the mana would have been. And we know ergot has similar chemical structures as LSD. So it would make sense to me that these priests were entering states of elevated consciousness. And in the later generations, they were a little too weak to do that. But back to your question is it would make 100% sense to me if this Eucharist, uh, I'm not too familiar with the pronunciation, if I said it right, would have been some type of brew that makes someone reckon with themselves, you know, bring someone into themselves. And now you're talking about the bad trip and the good trip. So there are schools of thought that says there is no such thing as yeah. a bad trip because even <laughs> the bad trip is here to let you see what's inside of you. And you may have not have known before that. So thank God you had that bad trip. And it just opened up gates that you need to deal with. Yes. And and it may not always be this fun ride, but you always have to go inside yourself and figure it out. And so that's like one thing. But the second thing is, let's say now it is this thing, bad trip, which no, obviously no one wants to find himself on. Someone's in a bad trip right now. Is that bad trip, quote unquote, called a bad thing? Or is there a purpose for it? Is there space for it? So what I was taught about hell from the Kabbalistic perspective is there is no place of hell where it's a lot of darkness. Hell is just basically a place where there's an abundant amount of light. Now, let me ask you a question. What happens if you're waking up, you're hungover, you didn't sleep, you're, you know, you're caught in mouth, the whole thing, it's the worst situation in the morning you could ever imagine. You can't get up, headache, got to wake up. Someone opens the blinds in your room and the light shines on your face. Now tell me one human who's going to be like, oh, I could see clearly, let's get up and do it. He's going to be like, I can't see, right? He's going to cover his eyes. He can't see. So they're saying that hell is that abundant light that blocks us from being able to see. And it's so strong, this light of, 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 of goodness that it blocks us. And this is exactly what we say the plague of darkness in Egypt was. It wasn't darkness. It was light. That's the flip side of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Just the Egyptians couldn't handle that spiritual light that had come. Yeah. So, but the whole thing is that darkness has a purpose. It's a, it's a cleansing mechanism. It, it does something to you. So I would say either there's two ways to an eternal state of bliss, direct, or you got to go through the darkness to get to the light. So if someone's like, oh, man, I'm having a bad trip in the darkness, I'd be like, guess what the next stop is? Light. Yeah. Like, you're on your way. So it's good I'm, news. I'm also reminded of the, this weird, obscure verse in Revelation that talks about, like, the sun and the people couldn't hide from the sun, you know, and the sun, mm. like, terrified them, which the sun is that light. And they're trying to hide from the light. They're trying to hide their deeds. And and within the darkness, but they couldn't do it. That's interesting. Yes, yeah, so that, that basically makes sense to it, uh, sense to me. So I think, you know, it would make sense that, you know, a lot of people would have a bad trip because their, re their reality was based off so much backwards, you know, backwardsness. It was yeah. so not in sync with the universal thought and principle. So you're going you're gonna to have to go into incredible shock, probably, to realize that your whole life is, is a falsehood. Yeah. And, and, and there's a lot of people who have done that, whether it's the use of psychedelics or we're going to talk about DMT being released in the brain and circumstances and situations that happen and people um, hitting rock bottom that has a way of, you know, you know, being in that the scripture says those who sat in darkness beheld a great light. Right. You're at this kind of like wits in. Wow. And, uh, and, right and the only way, you know, out of it is up, you know, um, going back to what you mentioned the uh, manna of the Bible. And there's a lot of people who believe that that's mushrooms, whether psychedelic, either or. Uh, I know Joe Rogan and those guys really talk about that and talk about the fact that they were eating, you know, magic. Everybody was eating magic mushrooms and, and getting these revelations and hearing and seeing God and all that kind of stuff. Um, my whole thing with that is the fact that everyone par partook and if everyone partook of magic mushrooms you wouldn't need moses and aaron to tell you what god was saying right now if moses and aaron were, were partaking of magic mushrooms in the priest that's a different subject but for like the manna that was coming down like they ate psilocybin to sustain themselves like 
everyone eating you know magic mushrooms what, what is your thought on that because they try to like across the board say yeah man i was these magic mushrooms that you know put you on a psychedelic trip to hear god and stuff well let's go through this is fascinating stuff um first of all we see from our text and our literature that the real spiritual boom uh for the israelites started at the plague of darkness at the plague of darkness was when this massive ball of light came this massive amount of light came and for the Egyptians, it put them in this very bad trip, a numbing trip. For the Israelites, we say they started getting revelations of godliness, uh, at the, like a, a taste of it, not like full, but they were getting the taste of it. Now we see another hint to this when the Israelites are crossing the sea. Um, our sages and our commentators and everything I'm speaking about is literally 2000 plus year old texts I've written down that I have sources for if anyone's interested in the fact checking. You have the sea splitting and the Israelites going through the sea. Now we teach that while the Israelites were in the sea, they were experiencing the water was made of precious stones, rocks, gems, crystals, uh, orchards, paradises, and herbs and spices that brought them to levels of understanding of godliness that is unfathomable. And we see at the splitting of the sea, the, the maidservant of your home, she would have seen more than the Ezekiel the prophet would have seen. She had a higher level of prophecy at that time, the simple maidservant at the time of splitting of the sea. So at this point, there is still no Moses being a middleman. This is everyone having open source access because the creator was revealing that. Um, after the sea splits, they're doing preparations for Mount Sinai. Now at Mount Sinai is when we peak and two things happen. First of all, as you said, you were right. The first commandments were actually spoken by God directly to the people of Israel. It wasn't Moses middlemanning anything. God spoke the first few commandments out loud to the people of Israel. And what happened is basically they died. They couldn't fathom that. And, and they had to die. And then they requested like Moses. And the Israelites requested Moses, you got to handle that because we, we cannot handle that situation. And we teach that while this was happening, while the Israelites were at the Sinai revelation, that the venom of the snake of Adam and Eve had left them meaning that people were in a state of full atonement from the repercussions of the sin of Adam and Eve. They were on pre-sin level. They were on Edenic consciousness at that time, everyone equally. And when you look at the, before the sin of Adam and Eve, Adam had this open activated brain, you know, whether we'll talk about was that endogenous DMT production or what it was, we'll get there. But the Israelites, without the help of Moses being a middleman, got to that level and had that direct connection revelation to God. And it was only after they couldn't handle it or fathom it that they had to like ask Moses to step in and be a middleman between them and the creator of the universe. And I mean, what, what do you think that was? Do you think that it was just being like, you know, stu stuck in what, what they would call the fallen world and just kind of deteriorating and everything just starts dying eventually from that original man? Or what do you, what do you think it was that kind of caused that? You mean from the, the original trip that the Israelites got in? Um, well, I mean, you know, we start, we see people supposedly start living less, you know, sin and, and death enters oh, the you're world. talking about from the time of Adam. Yeah, from everyone just being able to kind of be in a, almost this Adamic state of like having a relationship with God to like, hey, we need somebody to talk to God for us. Like, what do you think that whole? Uh, what it seems like to me is that there's levels to the game and the human body and the human technology is far greater than we could ever imagine. Mm -hmm. And so let's let's introduce a term called the activated human. Let's say a human is fully activated, functioning at 100 percent. A activated human could probably sit with his eyes closed in a meditative state for years on end without needing food or anything. He could sit in a hibernation state in the most blissful existence you could ever possibly imagine, uh, you know, way greater than any VR, virtual reality. Like time during those few years of meditation would pass you like the blink of an eye. So I believe human has that ability inside of them just to exist in a realm of light without needing to nourish the body because there's other ways we can probably get nourished. And I think Adam was there and something happened where he fell from there and now his breathing changed and the way his stress levels, everything changed. He's damaging the body. He's aging the body. That's like getting a fancy car that needs diesel gas and you just keep filling up with regular gas. It'll drive. For, it's going to break down the whole thing and tear, wear and tear it down. So let's say people just don't have access to diesel. They're like, Oh yeah, in this part of the world, cars last three to four months. That's just what you're gonna get. And that's just what it's been for hundreds of years. And someone would be like, you know, I remember a time cars could last 20, 30 years. You know, you just had to do the oil change, you gotta take care of it. So I can imagine that after the fall of Eden, 
we just stopped knowing how to be activated humans and we just started deteriorating ourselves based on the way we're breathing improperly, eating improperly. I mean, we're, we're probably overeating so much that our metabolism is just absolutely shocked and rocked and we're aging ourselves at unprecedented rates. And, you know, I am not exempt from that. I still battle my own food issues of, you know, how I eat and what I eat. You yeah. know, I'm on a vegan diet and I'm doing intermittent fasting. That doesn't mean when I can eat, I'm, I'm not going to town. So i um, trying my best. But that's probably what, what we're dealing with is the fall from Adam is the fall from knowing how to use the human technology. Yeah, that's deep. And, um, and the interesting thing is like, you know, when you go into uh, a psychedelic experience, a lot of those original technologies are explained to you whether it's seeing um, cogs and shapes and symbols and those kind of things, you see a lot of that stuff like the, the um, sacred, sacred geometry. But as far as like being in the moment, clean up your diet, like a lot of these, these things that you're taking from eternity, I believe, I believe we're tapping into the place we go when we die, that, those kind of realms. Um, but there's these eternal essences that are communicated with you of how to become a better human how to take care of your body and go to the next levels would do, would you agree do you get that that kind of information when you've had your experiences and 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 just listening to what other people are bringing to the table as well how to get over your unresolved issues listen this thing is blocking you your unforgiveness is blocking you and it's hurting you and it you know all, all of that stuff is is communicated to people yeah so two things one is i think it's kind of like am fm radio you know you could be listening to AM radio, this boring news station, all of a sudden you just press a button, you switch to FM, and all of a sudden it could be the best song you've ever heard. So I think that what's happening with AM and FM radio, there are two frequencies that are being broadcast, whether you like it or not. You were just only able to tap into one. Yeah. Now you are doing something to pick up another frequency. So what, what seems to be happening from what I've learned from the Jewish point of view is that there's this word Shefa. There's secretions flowing down, emanations flowing down from the higher levels, from the creator down here. And whatever, however much we could handle it, we will pick, pick that up. And I'll give an analogy. Let's say I have a plastic cup and I pour boiling hot water in it. What's going to happen? The water pours through the bottom of the cup. It melts the cup. Now, let's say I have a glass cup or a styrofoam cup and I pour, styrofoam is not eco-friendly. Let's call it glass cup. I, have, I pour some hot water, a boiling hot water in the glass cup. The glass cup holds it. So based on how we are as a vessel, how much light we could hold or handle is what we could pick up from the universe and handle that. So when you go to these type of states, what's happening that you can now pick up more information? Besides the scientific you know, aspect of seeing the right side of the brain, the left side of the brain cross-triggering and making friends and meeting each other, just like me and you are doing now across the world, two points that weren't maybe meant to meet are just interacting. That's a psychedelic experience in, its, in itself. But what's, so what's happening while that happens is um, what I believe we teach that a man has access to very small piece of his soul. While you are alive in your consciousness, you are experiencing a micro share of your soul. And the greater context of your soul exists in this place called the world of souls. And so on your day-to-day -day basis, you will have a soul inside you, but the consciousness of your soul is, is very limited compared to what, where and what your soul really is. So when you do these plant medicines and your left side and your right side start triggering off your brain, I believe what you're doing is getting access to more of your soul. And once you're becoming more soul versus human on the ratio of how much soul I am to human, you are now naturally able to pick up more universal thoughts. So that's why you hear so many people today being like, oh, you know what? Like, I just want to get some land with some friends and like go off grid and solar and this and that. I'd be like, Yo, man, I had the same idea. That's crazy. It was like, no, you didn't have the same idea. This is the idea. This is what's happening in the universe. There's certain people who are able to just pick up on that because they're being more soul versus body. Yeah. And the word for uh, human in Hebrew is Adam, Adam, which is actually, you know, Adam and Eve. But the Hebrew word is Adam. When you want to talk about a man, you say B'nai Adam, the children of man. And we're all referred to as Adam. But Adam is actually broken up into two words. You have the first letter, which is Aleph, is the A sound. And then you have the last is Dam, so A and Dam. In Hebrew, Dam means blood, is the physical. And when the, the Aleph, it refers to number one, which is always referring to God and to the soul. So we see Adam is made up of two realities, the soul and the body, stuck together into one existence. This is the, this is the ph phenomenon of humanity, is that we are a soul and a physical body in one reality. 
And so we always have a ratio of how much soul to body are you? And that all has to do with parts of your brain, dopamine, how you train yourself for rewards and pleasures. Do you have instant gratification? You yeah. may be more animal. When I have an urge, do I act on it? Well, guess yeah. what? You're more animal. Or maybe I'm like, you know what? That's not the best, you know? And that's how that ratio. But when you are on a psychedelic experience, you don't have a desire for a cheeseburger or for intimacy with a woman necessarily and not in every case you you were like i don't even want to touch t leave me alone yeah. to think about bro them, I, you know? i've had i've had friends speaking of the bad trip with like cows would come to them when they were like just eating a lot of red meat and eating a lot of hamburgers like the spirit of mm -hmm. a cow would visit them and and like plead with them not to eat them and stuff it's wild like really deep inner stuff that they're dealing with you know yeah so the more animalistic you are the harder it will be for you to tap into your soul's thought process. Yeah. And again, like, you know, the, the whole thing of, of whether that stuff is real or whether it's just deeply encoded within our brain or our DNA. I mean, that brings up something interesting too. I mean, when you, you know, I know Joe Rogan talks a lot about the machine elves and your grandparents visiting you on ayahuasca that, that have passed away and all of those kind of things. It's like, did that really happen? Or, or did it? Did you just visit them in the dream state and you created it? And I like this this notion of idea. Like, I mean, who knows, right? But the, the notion and idea of like you experiencing it, you leave with the benefits of as it was real, like it really happened, and, and your life has changed because of it. You know, what do you think That's as far question. as like? Are we really experiencing heavenly beings and beings of the fifth dimension that are angelic in nature that are teaching us the secrets of the universe or is it all in our head? What do you what do you think? I love the, I love the question. You asked such great questions. Um, I just want to open that answering my opinion on the matter with a quick short story. I had a friend, uh, God forbid, we should never know, was heavily addicted to opiates. So he had to self-treat himself. So he took a, an ibogaine plant medicine ceremony, which ibogaine is a, a very heavy psychedelic trip, you know, a day to two days under. And it's supposed to help you get off the addiction without withdrawal symptoms, which is an unheard of, you know, miracle. Thank God he did what he had to do. He kicked it, got off the heroin in the 24 to 48 hour period. And he got involved in a, with a few doctors who were asking him research questions about your experience. They were studying it, right? And they said to my friend, hey, you know, they knew, uh, uh, you know, he was an Ashkenazi Jew from Europe, European ancestry. And they said to him, um, and don't, you know, don't feel free to ask me any hard questions about that after. They said to him, did you have any Holocaust visions in your trip? And he said to them, like, you know, what kind of random question is that? Like, why would you ask me that? And then he stops and thinks, he's like, oh my God, I did. I was running from these Nazis in the woods and this and that, and I was hiding, terrified. And he's like, why would you know to ask me that? And they said, because we've seen a lot of uh, Jewish people from European descent actually have Holocaust visions. Wow. And what we believe is happening is they're dealing with uh, ancestral trauma stored on the DNA. Mm -hmm. uh, on the genetic level. So I think that once that, and, and you know what I've heard on NPR radio, the same story with African Americans taking ayahuasca and running in the fields from slave owners. Yeah. Uh, I, I've, I've seen those. And I think that 100% there is data stored on our DNA where the biggest reality shock most people have to face is you are not your own independent existence that found itself on planet earth. You are a continuation of something that happened thousands of years before you. And whether you like it or not, you have to reckon with that. Yeah. You have to deal with that. And so what I think is happening is, which we'll talk about the high priest of Israel and the plants usage in the temple of Israel, what the purpose and functionality was, was to erase general uh, generational trauma. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm going to try to swap a word right now. I want to swap the words of saying atonement for sin is equal to the word of erasing generational trauma. Love it. And so I think that's what's happening right now. So when someone does go to that space and they're meeting, whether it's a voice, an entity or something, I think that's your DNA being put into a projector. And now you are watching the video of what your DNA is trying to communicate with you. And 
you do hear a lot of terms like, you know, prophets and angels and, le- and you know, all these things. So like one thing I definitely don't believe, I don't believe there are physical aliens out there riding on spaceships necessarily, but I do believe there are multiple layers of dimensions of entities and realities that exist out there. And I yeah. don't think they exist independently from the creator of the universe. I yeah. think they're within the confines of what are, whatever creation we find ourselves in. There's only one narrative. It's not like, oh, we got our thing and they're doing their thing. There's one storyline going on and there's levels to the game. But most of the time, I really believe when you see an angel or something, you are trying to communicate with yourself. Yeah, I mean, shoot, so so many places to go with that. Um, a lot of people even th- talk about the demons just being maybe something that you created or an aspect of something that, that hey, you've experienced sure. as well. And even, the, well, again, if we're talking about the, the bad trip, there's some darkness inside of you that you just had to deal with. Um, you mentioned these beings, right? I'm, I'm big on, on a lot of that, so I love it. It's just super interesting. Terrence McKenna, going back to Mushrooms, talks about how these psilocybin mushrooms that are seem to be from off world seem like a antenna a walkie talkie that allows you to communicate with beings from the higher realms like if you want to communicate this is what you do you partake of this and then you receive of the heavenly wisdom or you go within which is an interesting notion as well yeah i mean listen i think you know i've listened to almost every minute of anything available for terence mckenna over and over for many years um one of the greater influences on my life Um, But at the same time, he said, you know, he said one thing that really did change my life. But I think he was also just a curious explorer who wasn't 100 percent sure of anything. He was just trying to make sense of it from what his perspective was. So he never really came out there and said, this is definitively what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Because he was too humble for that because he's he's been humbled. But he did say something interesting. He said everyone has an obligation today, a moral obligation to go on to the other side and to go into that dimension and to bring back crucial information that will one day save the planet. And he said, that's where that information is going to come. And from my perspective, it's already too late to, to, uh, to prove it wrong because, you know, you look at 1960s and the psychedelic, you know, boom, the whole world was shaped off of that, you know, that love that shot out of there. So it was already too, we, people already went on to the other side and came back with information. That all of our music that we enjoyed today, you know, it all comes from that realm. Yeah, it doesn't exempt us, but let me, let's say Terrence McKenna says, if you want to have access to higher beings, so let me try to rephrase what he was saying, from my opinion, not what he was saying, but from my opinion, maybe he was saying that when he says higher beings, maybe saying higher up in the ladder of your DNA historically from like predating your existence, there's energy that you have to get in touch with or something like that. So there is for sure you are getting in touch with something that is external from you that's communicating with you that we all know is that a third party like lawyer in the upper realms who's got your back or is that your great great grandfather's trauma stored as mathematical formula in your dna communicating with yourself through a projection of your brain to make it make sense to you that's a mystery you know that's a mystery that i don't know who could prove 100 percent definitively yet yeah I'm with it. And uh, something you mentioned a while ago, just talking about how, you know, this looking at sin as this uh, trauma that's stored in your DNA and, and getting free of that that trauma and things. And, you know, in, in the spiritual community, I talk to a lot of people who are big on reincarnation. I'm not really big on on the fact of reincarnation and coming back, nor do I want to come back as a different entity or person. Um, but the, the idea of People are having these so-called, you know, past life regressions and kids are coming, being born with knowledge of other existences. Like at three and four years old, they're telling you these stories of people who literally died and a lot of weird stuff that that tied into that. Uh, A friend of mine, Adam Starseed Bay, who was here in the comments a while ago, just give him a shout out. He brought the the idea uh, up first that maybe a lot of what these people are experiencing as past lives are just them getting this information from their DNA. So it's not as someone that you existed as a king in, in, in Egypt or whatever, but it was that maybe your great, 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 great grandfather did and you're still receiving visions and thoughts and influences by things from your uh, ancestral DNA. The thoughts on that, you know? Yeah, that's a great question. It's a good thought. It's another one of those areas that no matter what, we'll never be able to 100% prove yet. 
but I could tell you what we teach from our perspective. And I don't know if you're going to like the answer, Go ahead. Uh, you know, because we do believe in uh, reincarnation from the Jewish Kabbalah perspective yeah. and that souls rotate, come in and out. The word is called uh, Gilgul, which is means like a wheel, like it's a rotation. So you're coming and going. Yeah. We do teach, though, that there is a process where a soul can retire and like you're all, you know, you're good. Uh, there's a process where new souls do come down. So you may be a new soul. That could be for sure something that happens. And there's a process where soul has to come down for tikkun to get fixed. So something has to get fixed in the soul. So it comes back down. Um, I have my own deep views on it because, you know, there are stories in the Talmud that says, you know, a rabbi would have said, if you would have lined up the Egyptian taskmasters from a thousand years ago, my soul remembers which one would have been the one to whip me. I remember the face of the man a thousand years ago who whipped my soul when I was in Egypt. You know, so that was that his great, great, great grandfather's soul and it's in his memory or was it his? That's definitely a, a very good question. But the way I look at it from my strange point of view is, you know, one time I was, I was just in deep meditation and I was watching a documentary on animals. And I noticed something very deep and I'm going to share a very deep point. I don't even know if I know how to articulate it so mm -hmm. well yet, but I noticed that. And, and before I say this, there is a teaching that the, the cats of Jerusalem are reincarnations of prostitutes. So it's like one of those things. So I'm always like real nice to the cats. I'm like, I, I'm like, I bet you never had a man give you like a warm, you know, treat you well. So I give the cat a little bowl of something, you know, I'm like, you deserve it. Little, little cat friend. Um, so you gotta be recognize that. So, but what I see about the animals are, Every animal has its own trip, you know, a very specific trip. This animal's monogamous. This animal it has shares multiple wives. This animal, you know, mates and, and the wife kills him during mating. Like they all have their unique trip that they have to deal with. Like the ants all work together to serve a king, you know, yeah. like every animal's got their and but, but no matter what the trip is, the animal, I'm able to find a human on planet Earth that has that same type of life. Oh, it's like, oh, you're sleeping around and cheating and this and that and stealing. Oh, I know a guy that does that. Oh, you're just a sheep. If I, I know. So every, every single animal on the planet, when you study them, you're able to find a very common theme between their existence and a specific type of human functioning on a very low animalistic level. So I'm like, so when we finish our life, or did we stamp ourselves of like whatever our soul is stamped as, it gets recycled into that thing that is the essence of what you were in your life. If you lived your life like this parakeet in this special island who does X, Y, Z, who gets the food and hoards it and then doesn't share it, whatever it is, do you become that parakeet because that's who you became? And the person who is a godly person, who's a soul person, a spiritual person who loved and cared and gives, when you die, guess where you go? You become part of the universe because that's what your existence was. So I had a whole thought process about that, but it's it's unsettled yet. Yeah. But you know, a lot of a, a lot of people like in the spiritual new age community who are having these conversations, right? You know, they're the ones having the conversations. Everybody's starting to catch up and, and be more open and apt to talk about these things, too, from a religious perspective. But it's, it's funny to see the shift because a lot of people, they, they won't talk about what you just said as coming back as an animal. Most people don't even mention that anymore. You know how we used to think of the, and just is kind of what you just said, but coming back as an insect or coming back as an ant or a flower or a dog that you're reincarnated as something like that. It seems like the shift as far as in the spiritual new age community is that you come back uh, strictly as a, a human. Yeah, no, that, that, that for sure. I ruled out once I learned, you know, 2000 year old teaching <laughs> that people become uh, prostitutes, become cats, you know, so, you know, I ruled that out, but um, so I do believe that we could come back as animals, it's, but, you know. It's so weird, people, because I find just, there's just so, so many holes in it, and I mean, there's holes in everything, right? There's holes in, 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 in reasons in why you don't want to look into something, and I, and I just find that people, like, you know, they, they usually, especially when they have the stories of who they were, they found out who it were, who they were from past life regression or i would say past life suggestion you know someone suggested to them do you see the little man in the corner well that's your grandpa and you know playing and planning these thoughts you know but someone was a great magician someone was a ruler someone was a king you know nobody was like a dog or a hawk or something like that anyway i, I don't rule it out there even you know in the new testament there's some there's some mention of you know elisha and 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 coming back and those kind of things as well um but I wanted to to and I want I want to go deeper into the psychedelic stuff here in a little bit, at least the natural things that we have. So I want to 
kind of go into that. But I want to use what you said a while ago kind of as a bridge for something else that you bring to the table. Um, and, and this bridge would be um, having people who are reincarnated and they know who they are. There's a sect of people um, from the Hebrew Israelites. And I want to talk about the Hebrew Israelites and who are the true Jews and, and just that whole study. But a, some of the extreme ones believe that they are Jesus, King David, Solomon. They believe that they are them reincarnated and they have found each other on the earth. So you have like, tw it'll be 12 black Hebrew Israelites hanging out on the street corner preaching. And all of them say that they are John, Jesus, you know, Matthias, like they are these people who have come back to, ca to continue their message and they found each other. So even within this black Hebrew Israelite movement, there's this weird, what I find it, it is a, an instant, um, validation, like instant credibility. I'm Jesus. You need to listen to me. My message is pure. My message is deep. Um, that I think that that's how reincarnation ties into something I want to talk to you about, which is the, he, the black Hebrew Israelites and who are the quote unquote true Jews and just your study on, on, on that whole phenomena. Ooh, yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot there. I mean, first and foremost, um, there's a lot to what they're saying and there's not a lot to what they're saying because it's not, the question is such a silly question in the first place. Who are the real ones? King Solomon had over a thousand wives. Uh, you know, the this, this, this children of Israel scattered to four corners of the world. Yeah. To think that you can take the people of Israel and put it in a box and say, it's this and not that, yeah. you're living in fantasy land. You can't possibly say who is or who isn't because you don't know the mystery of how the genetics scattered across the Silk Road, how it went up into Northern Europe, how it went into Africa. Um, so that's like the first question already is like, who, the question is false. The question should never be, who are the real ones? That is that question takes away legitimacy from the asker. But if someone does say, is it possible that the African-Americans are also descendants from the children of Israel, mm -hmm. right? Now that's a legitimate question. Now we could talk. But to come in and bring and to answer that a question by excluding everyone else, yeah. that's where you, lo you lose it. Because um, to, to, to actually include a lot of those people are excluding and something that they would say and I've learned to, to be true that everybody wants to be the people of the book. That is something that I've learned from the Hebrew Israelites. And I found that to be true um, with a lot of those teachings, you know? Right. Now, when you do look at it, um, you look at the government of Israel today. They have a report um, about of communities around the world that potentially come from the ancient tribes of Israel. And they report on the, the millions of people across the Silk Road, the millions of people in Africa. We all know about the Ethiopians. But actually the largest tribe in Africa in that report is the Igbo tribe, I-G-B-O, another term for the Igbo, the Biafrans of Nigeria. There's about 40 to 50 million of them in Nigeria. And the government of Israel says, hey, these people have likely the seed of Israel. There's 60 functioning uh, religious Torah observant communities there right now, eighth day circumcision, they're not eating pig, they're following the laws of Moses. They say that's who they are. It's, it seems pretty legit. And that's a beautiful thing. And they're connecting with Israel and they're having a good relationship. But now if you look at the transatlantic slave trade, you're seeing about 20 to 25% of all the slaves came from specifically this one tribe. So now there's no smoke without a fire. So now you're telling me the African-Americans in, in America have a blood relation to the largest tribe in Africa that we recognize as being the children of Israel. So now all of a sudden these people are calling themselves Israelites out of nowhere so obviously there could be and likely a spark of Israel inside of them. And that's a beautiful thing also. But what's happening in between that spark of Israel and them is something, this big fat elephant in the room called trauma. They're living in the land of their oppressors. They were living in a land where their grandparents were beaten, raped, tortured, separated from each other. And everyone's just supposed to move on like nothing happened. Like, hey, just get a new pair of Nikes. Like, what are you, what's the, what are you complaining about? It's like, no, bro, like what happened? Like what just went down? Like they can't, we're not processing what just went down. So that trauma takes them and puts all white men in that category. So let's say I had a dog bite me when I was four years old and now I'm 14 years old and I hear a dog bark. Guess what the brain, my brain's gonna do to me. It's gonna send me into shock. It's gonna protect me. Even though the dog barking may be the nicest, most therapeutic healing dog in the world, 
my brain doesn't can't know that my brain is like no dog is dangerous go so i think that's what's happening for african americans and the white man um especially you know a white jewish man that's very threatening to them because if they feel like they have this identity you know it's not going to work so i think that the the thing separating the great reunion of the house of israel is going to be a lot of trauma that we're going to have to speak about and how to cope with that and how to deal with that so my answer would be the black hebrew israelite theory is based on what i believe a true connection to the ancient people of israel i don't believe one iota that that excludes asian looking jews indian looking jews white looking yeah. jews uh is what that doesn't exclude that so yeah they could be a part of it but they're gonna have to deal with the fact that they're there in the land of their oppressors still living under unbearable amount of trauma and um have have you have you had talks with uh debates or discussions with some of those who are more militant in in the hebrew israelites that would consider oh, you a time. devil the ones who would consider the white man the devil and stuff. Oh man, yeah. If you look on YouTube and uh, just that, I've been at like business meetings. So they're like, "Why are people calling you a devil on YouTube? Like, what's going on?" I'm like, "Oh, let me explain." You know, um, but I actually got into a debate unintentionally. I'd given a lecture once on the lost tribes of Israel, where I filmed it and I put it on the internet, and I said that like little clip I said now about this transatlantic slave trade and the coming and the connection between the study of the government of Israel. And one of those militant black Hebrew Israelites uh, took that clip and put it on his page. And um, this was a few years ago. It had about a million views on Facebook and within 24 hours and uh, all from black Hebrew Israelite or African-Americans. Um, my, I didn't even realize what was going on, but my inbox <laughs> flooded. Next, next thing you know, I get a phone call. My phone rings like, hey, is this the rabbi in Jerusalem? Okay. I'm like, yeah, it's me. They're like, we need you to come to New York to debate our grandmaster scholar. We're going to fly you out and we're going to debate. And I, I didn't know who was calling me, what they were talking about. I didn't know anything. I was just like, I was like thinking to myself, I'm like, free flight and an intellectual conversation in New York? I'm down. Sign me up. You know, let's do it. And then like the next thing I know, I wake up the next day and my friend's like, yo, there's flyers all over Harlem and uh, Upper West Side Manhattan. The pictures of you and this guy, you're going in for, like with this guy, you know? And I was like, oh man, I didn't realize. And then we had like a weigh in in Harlem where I went in like one on one with these guys and we weighed in and I was debating like one of the master grand conscious guys of their community, like third eye Pharaoh champion type of guy. <laughs> and and I had a lot of respect for him because he was very smart, but they were filled with so much hate and they and the whole time they kept trying to get me to be filled with hate and to show my colors. And I was like, guys, you don't understand. I'm just a ball of love and light. Like you can't get me <laughs> off, off of that trip. Like I'm just here, you know? Yeah, and, even um, he, he, even Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. <laughs> His so, show is know, true colors. Exactly. Yeah. So that's what they were trying to say, show the true colors, Harry, you know? So, um, so at the end of the day, I was debating someone who claimed that the real spirituality came from ancient Egypt and the Hebrews hijacked it. So he was also kind of like militant enough to go against the black Hebrew Israelites. And he was saying the real spirituality lies in ancient Egyptian mysticism. Yeah. Yeah. So I went in for the debate locked and loaded with the history of plant medicine in ancient Egypt and the history of Israelites and plant medicine and what the real battle was about. It was about ego and open sourcing plant medicine instead of keeping it in like a Pharaoh caste like system where you had the God man ruling over the people for the plant medicine stuff. So I kind of came in where they were not expecting me to come in that direction. So they didn't have a valid response to the level of yeah. information I brought. Went but over at the head. same time, <laughs> well, at the same time, it was just a knockout because I was in a room for the real debate. It must have been thousands of people, a lot of angry people, a lot of beautiful people also. Love, I got a lot of love, by the way, a lot of love for having the, the courage to step in the lion's den. The people gave me respect for that. And I admire the community fully. So I'm not saying anything bad about that. I'm just reporting what was happening. And I'm in the room with all these woke people. You know, and part of my presentation, I'm talking about the pineal gland. I'm talking about endogenous DMT and I'm talking about healing and conspiracy theories with fluoride and the Jews in World War II. We're going there. And all of a sudden, like I, I, I had this like secret attack that I pulled out of my back pocket because at the weigh in a few months earlier, I had the guy I was debating against. I had seen him brushing his teeth like before the conversation because he just got off a flight and he was walking around with his toothpaste and his toothbrush. I give a quick look. I see the guy's got Arm and Hammer. So I quickly go to my phone. I Google. I'm like, Arm and Hammer, fluoride free options. No, Arm and Hammer does not have a fluoride free option. So I'm like, my guy up here is claiming to be the awoken third eye pioneer for his community, 
brushing his teeth with some fluoride, calcifying his pineal gland, I said he is he's like an invalid candidate to be who he says he is. So, you know, at, at, and he even had an eye of Horus painted on his eye at the debate. So at the debate, like I kind of just like, and I saved this information the whole time because leading up to the debate, there was radio shows and talk shows and interviews and it was like hype and I saved it to myself. And in the middle of the debate, I laid it out there. I'm like, bro, I don't know how to tell you this, but I caught you brushing your teeth with fluoride. Like you can't, you know, and the whole audience I'm sure. was like, Whoa! Yeah, I'm sure, yeah. You know, it was like this crazy moment. I felt, I actually felt horrible, embarrassing <laughs> like that. But I had to just like be like, you, you can't be the pioneer for truth for these people. Like, stop arguing and bringing like the div division here. But, Hopefully uh, that you humbled know, them, man. It, you know, again, that darkness or getting the chair kicked from from under you, you know, kind of brings that. You know, what I'm saying humility, pride cometh before a fall. You know, and so yeah. sometimes it takes yeah. something like that for we kind of wake up or become less militant, become more light and love, you know? Right. So one of those guys was, uh, for sure what you said is true. One of those guys was in the news today. His name is Young Pharaoh. Another one of those so uh, people, guys from that community. Yeah, he's real loud on, I mean, somebody's mentioned his name in the, in the comments. Well, he and, just got like banned from like this big convention. He was in like New York Post today because of comments he made against the Jews. It's only he's a matter offering... of time before they all get pulled in this day and age. Right. Well, he, a young Pharaoh happens to be a genius and he's very yeah. smart and very educated. I just don't think he's got the, it's hard to be, you could be a genius in your area, but he's not a genius of what we believe in. So he tries to speak too much on behalf of our beliefs. So he's very off with that. But yeah. I think he's offering like $50,000 now to a rabbi who could defeat him in a, in a debate on is the Torah Judaism, like a, a, a fabricated thing. I was like, sure, I could use sure $50,000 for the farm. So if anyone knows young Pharaoh out there, you let him know I'm willing to have that $50,000 conversation. Yeah, but I'm sure he's going into that thinking that he won and, and not really ready to put the money up, you know, because a lot of people's know. minds are already made up. You know what I'm saying? Like when you go into that, you have yeah, to be you have to be apt to learn, man. You know what I'm saying? And that's how you really are a true seeker is you're apt to learn. You're apt to be corrected. I heard there was a there, there was a word. Um, comedic word that means that you're a teacher and a re and a and a student at the same time and and you know many times in that movement you, you can't teach an old dog new tricks you know they're kind of like set in their ways and it's a big thing that happens for people in a lot of these movements wow i love that and we do teach in judaism that the teacher learns more from his students than yeah. he does from like what he studies i um are you familiar with the uh, uh, br brother Rakar Shiar from the Gathering of Christ Church? Uh, not yet. They um, um, were early days of YouTube and like kind of pioneering a lot of videos on on YouTube about the Black Hebrew Israelite movements. They wore all white, um, preached in in Philly a lot, and uh, just wearing all white and um, had run-ins with like Tazadakia and uh, ICGJC and all those kind of guys or whatever but i was uh, i actually studied under them for several years and how they taught me how to study the scriptures and um and, and they were more open like they caught flack because they were open for gentiles supposedly coming into uh israel and, and as long as they keep the commandments and and repent of their sins and those kind of things that mm -hmm. like that god would would deal with them and, and as long as they would keep keep start keeping the feast and turn from your pagan worship and Christmas and Easter, which I did for like eight years or whatever. We totally went down that route. But um, all of my stuff came to a head. I did a lot of their graphic art. We flew them in to come preach in Mobile and we went out on the streets with them. And um, all my stuff came to a head from being militant Hebrew Israelite. I'm a, uh, you know what I'm saying, Native American from the tribe of Gad. Um, all, my, all my pride and studies came to a halt. It was when... I ended up working at a job site in uh, in Mississippi with people who uh, were were uh, br bringing their Bibles to work, and I would sprinkle a little stuff here just to see where they were. And we talked about the Jews, and they're like, "Yeah, the Revelations two and nine, Revelations three and nine. They're the the you know there are those who say they are the Jews, but are not." And for me at the time, I'm on this you know white people aren't true Jews or whatever. White people are devils, those kind of things, and. Uh, and he was like, yeah, so we try to start exchanging notes because he was in on it. But it, but from his perspective, the white man was the true Jew, you know, and these guys were uh, Klansmen. These guys were in the, in the KKK, the Ku, Ku Klux Klan in Mississippi, 
card carrying clansmen. And he let me see his Bible. And just like I would have all of these beautiful scriptures underlined and highlighted about God's love and all of these kind of things, like everything that had to do with white nationalism in this, in his Bible from Genesis to Revelation was underlined. And, and they knew most of the scriptures that I knew. And we started like having these debates on the job site about, you know, who's the true Jews and true Israelites and stuff. And then um, for me, a lot of things began to come clear because he told me one thing. This is what he told me. And um, he said, we'll talk about it. We'll debate. And every day we'll go study and come back and just go at it every day at work. He said, I want you to do this one thing and then we'll go further in our conversation. He said, I want you to go home. You got a strong concordance, right? I said, yeah. He said, pull out your strong concordance and look up what the word Adam means. Adam. Look up Adam. And I want you to read the definition. Read what it means. And I go reading it. And, and understanding that, you know, the black people fit a lot of the descriptions of the curses of the Bible and not ha having their names stripped from them and all kinds of things. And I read it and it says that Adam means ruddy, able to show red in the face. And uh, and, you know, and I don't want to go real deep into that, but it was something that when I read it, I was like, wow. And it was like and I go back and tell him, I said, ruddy. He said, yeah. This is the, the 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 true Jews are when when they sin, when they lie, they blush, they turn red because they've they've they're sinning and, and, and they're showing that on their face. And he just they went into this whole spiel. And uh, and I went back to the leaders. I went back to the you know, what I'm saying the, the leaders of the Israelites. And I was like, hey, man, like I need an answer for this dude. You know what I'm saying? Like it should be something easy. All of you guys should be able to to uh, to, to break this down and give me something to say. And. None of them could answer it. They were like, "Man, I think the I think the Most High got to work for you, man." Uh, blah blah blah. And they, none of them could answer that that question about this Adam. They would say that it was changed, you know, that that was added later. That's all they. That's all what they'll tell you. Like, listen, that that wasn't in the original version. That was added, tampered with. That doesn't really mean that Adam. You come from the dirt. The dirt is black. So the original man is black. You know, it's just weird things. But and the guy said, if you can't get past the adam like one of the first mentions of adam in the bible then we can't have a discussion that's what kind of broke my whole prideful thing or going in of who is a true jew and all of these kind of things or whatever um shout out to uh somebody in the chat david McHenry. he worked on that job site with me he knows exactly what i'm talking about shout out man but yeah just that that conversation for me um in a lot of other, you know, scriptures in the New Testament, like a true Jew is one who is a Jew inwardly. And and there's, you know, multiple colors and do not abhor an Edomite for he is your brother. Because you're going around calling people Edomites and devils and all this kind of stuff. And you don't even know. And the scripture says to judge no man according to the flesh. You know what I'm saying? Or according to their, their skin color. So for me, when I was hit with that, it was like, man, I got to chill out on it, all this, you know, skin color and who's the devil and who God loves and who God hate, you know, God hated uh, uh, Esau, you know, God loved Jacob, but he hated Esau and thinking that there's a people group out there that God hates and stuff. And it was just a lot of darkness in that stuff, man. But that's how I shook. I got shook out of that. Wow, it's crazy. I mean, first of all, you see the word uh, for Adam being red and ready in complexion with two other people, with Esau and with Adam, uh, with uh, King David. That same word is yeah, used yeah, in white, language to describe yeah. them. Well, no, I, I, it, you know, let's say it says red and ruddy, right? Yeah. I, and so I know someone who will say, you know, the best soil in the world is red soil from Africa, you know? So I'm like, okay. So it's not really anything there to prove it. Yeah. <laughs> but I will tell you that Rabbi Judah the Prince who wrote down the Mishnah 2,000 years ago was Israelite. So 2,000 something years ago, he says very clearly, the children of Israel were not white and they were not black. They were this color called boxwood. That's what he says, which is a very brown, you know, Yemenite, but kind of Nigerian mix, a darker skin mix. Um, that's what the children of Israel were, he said. But then that's that was referring to the children of Israel. Again, King Solomon had a thousand wives. King David had sodomite and other blood in him, you know, all these different things, you know, because he, he comes from Moab, from the Moabites, and Moab comes from Lot, and Lot married a, a woman from S S Sodom and Gomorrah. So if anyone's going to possibly try to look into color skin and tie it back to the children of Israel, <laughs> you are going to go into full circles. 
Um, at the end of the day, you know, I do believe in the Native American uh, or First Tribes theory that they could have passed over the Bering Strait 2,600 years ago and come down into the Americas, or they could have arrived on boats. That makes a lot of sense to me based on what I've studied about some of the language and culture of the First Tribes here in America. But it would be insane for me to suggest that because someone is one color of skin, it's not possible we have some type of link later on. But it's also the craziest thing is when it becomes a man-made religion, when someone talks about being a direct pure blood of the children of Israel versus being a convert, right? Um, because the Torah warns you multiple, multiple times that there's absolutely no difference between the homeborn and the convert, yeah. that they both get grafted in and become one. And not only that, it's a sin to remind the convert that he was a convert. <laughs> so it's like, I don't know if you're on a new religion where you think that this is an exclusive club, but like, I'm a Jew. And my family trace actually traces itself back to King David. Maybe I don't know why I have a red beard, maybe not. But I do have a family tree literally for almost 3,000 years that has a Wikipedia page for almost every person on the, on the chain because it's one of those family lines. Um, you know, does that does that mean that someone, you know, someone else couldn't have married another girl from another? It's it's totally speculation once we bring in color skin into yeah. the whole matter. Um, and so I get very not like I don't get offended. I get offended by people who get offended. There's no room for being offended because we all have to reinforce our chill and stay strong without having anyone else mess with us. Um, but at the end of the day, I just like I'm just confused of like, what, what verse do you have to suggest that you are better than me? And so if you want to call me, I'm fine being a convert or an or from the line of King David. It shouldn't make a difference to me. I'm like, yeah, I'm like, there was yeah. no practical difference in my relationship with the Torah, with the creator of the universe, with anything. If I am from a direct male from King David or if I am a, a convert, besides the fact that someone from King David could be the Messiah. But that's too much pressure for a guy like me. I'm just sitting back watching, waiting for someone to do the job, you know, for sure, man. Um, I'm with it. A lot to be said when it comes to that. Have you ever heard, and someone said Irish here in the chat earlier, um, and you talk about your red beard and stuff. Have you heard of the Irish origins of civilization? There's somebody put out a uh, presentation. It was um, Dr. Mike, uh, not Dr., but Michael Tessarian. Uh, it's big on that. And there's a lot of people, you know, who, who believe that the, you know, the original man uh, were, were Vikings and, you know, they wore kilts and stuff. And, you know, it just as part of their culture. And we know that the, you know, Israelites wore these kilts or dresses or skirts, if you will, you know, those kind of things. Have you looked into that at all? Uh, yeah, there is a lot. I mean, um, if if you look at uh, the northern part of Israel and the exile, they have the Black Sea right above Israel, like literally right on top. Now, tribes of Israel going to exile, we know they went to the Black Sea and from there they went to different directions. But from the Black Sea, you actually have what's called the Danube River um and it, like the river uh the danube river dan you know and it goes right into the germanic regions and from then you go to the north you got Denmark, you know the danish people um the hebride islands up there and so if you do look at the ancient uh gaelic origins and all these uh saxon theories it makes a ton of sense to me that there could have been a few israelite businessmen or five thousand israelites traveling there and spread their information and spread their wisdom so it would make all the sense in the world to me to say that that's true and i like to i have a theory i like to lay out there it's called the joseph and esther theory you know joseph from the bible and we got esther from the story of purim in uh, the book of esther what's the common denominator between the two of them they were both israelites who got sent to far-flung regions of the world who somehow met, ended up going from the bottom to the top who became second in power, became the most powerful person in there. And if you look at Joseph, who marries the daughter of an Egyptian priest, he's got kids in Egypt. Now imagine if the children of Israel never made it down to Egypt, and it was just Joseph laying low there with his two kids rising second in power. The children of Joseph, 2,000 years later, would be millions of people. It would be called B'nai Yosef, the children of Joseph. And so they would be from the tribes of Israel also, but from one man. So it could have been one smart, slick businessman who made it up to the Scottish tribes <laughs> up there and, everything. and was like, yeah, and he's like, you know what? I actually know how we could harvest some electricity from these rocks. And they're like, well, you're the king, <laughs> you know? And next thing you know, the guy's like, here's how we're going to roll. Here's how we're going to play the cards. And now all of a sudden, boom. And you see the ex exile of Israel happened 2,700 years ago. That's the first exile. 
you see across the Silk Road, three major things pop up, Buddhism, Shintoism, and the Pashtun, and the same within a hundred years. And you see the same exact thing with the, you know, with the Vikings in there. You see people going from worshiping gods and offering their kids as sacrifices to bring down rain to all of a sudden going into the spirituality nirvana cults of trying to reach, you know, spiritual shamanistic states uh, without the human sacrifice to appease gods. So you wonder what information was uh, transferred exactly during those years. And then you take a look and you're like, hey, the Israelites were like a glass bottle. It was thrown to the floor and smashed. And it and it, how are you going to pick up every one of those glass shards? It's going to be everywhere. And we know from the story of Esther and Joseph that when the Israelites do get scattered to far flung places, they don't just become, they don't blend in, basically. They become game changers. So basically what you had is a nation of game changers scattered to the four corners of the world. And that that's where the mystery of the tribe starts, yeah. you know, because yeah, yeah, yeah. Four corners. it literally could be anyone and any, and you know, it's everywhere. Yep. Yeah, I'm with it, man. And it's, it's a good take, you know, keep, keep away from this pride and feel like you're, um, there's a lot of weird stuff, you know, a lot of the people carry, you know, they, they, uh, you know, carry that as a badge of honor, their skin color. And I, you should, you know, you should, you know, be proud of your heritage, whatever it is, but to think that you're better than, you know, someone else or sub someone else is subservient because of their race or whatever. It's something that they well, can't help, you know? you know, it's a coping method uh, to be, you know, to have something that you at least know you're proud of. But at the end of the day, um, when I was debating African-American guys, I did, like, I gave them some credit. I was like, listen, you know, I grew up in America. I went to public school, Yeah. you know, thinking back at it, going to rewind now as a white guy, I, my first music I listened to, the first CDs I got was ODB, Old Dirty Bastard, Notorious B.I.G. I was wearing my Patrick Ewing jersey, my Anthony Hardaway jersey to school. I said African-American culture was the culture. It was yeah, the option for, sure. for someone to be considered cool in the public school system. And so I said, you know, I'm going to give that to you guys. It's very clear you are the origins of what's hip and cool in America to a degree. Um, I was also going to talk about the Native American Indies because there's also that in there, but but you guys are what's cool. And, and I said, you know what? I'm not even offended if you have the melanin in your skin and you are a better jumper, runner, singer, then you may be better all those things than me. And that doesn't offend me. I'm actually happy for you. You got that. Uh, you could be the Ferrari and I'll be the Chevy, you know, the Chevy. Like, it's fine. Yeah. I'm cool with that. But but I'm not a devil. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm a lot of things, but I'm not a devil. You know, and, and it's so weird, man. Like you know just deal I, I don't deal with a lot of them anymore just because it, it's like a first for many of them it's a switch where it goes from like loving peaceful to like oh you're devil you know what i'm saying and so how can you how can you walk or, or be like you know comrades with someone who thinks that you're a you're an abomination to god like that is a weird delusion I, i'm gonna call it a, a delusion i don't think it's healthy um so it's really hard to to hang out or be friends or or even have a conversation with somebody even even a lot of those um uh the uh the people in the clan who believe they they believe you can't even they won't even talk to black people like it was a sin to even try to share knowledge with them or try to educate like they get into some weird stuff um uh, when it but i'm gonna say this when it comes to the the hebrew israelite movement as far as the, the black hebrew israelite movement and I know you know this going to public school and being a part of black culture and stuff like, you know, that these were people who were told that they're nothing. They were called every name in the book and, and you know, slaves and, and, and the ancestral DNA and, and, and not having an identity and many of them not having fathers at home. And, you, you know, you, you're you can either go to the army or, or go to prison or you're going to die. A lot of a lot of people in, in those projects and stuff don't live past 21 like it's a miracle you know, to, to do that or past 17 in some cases, but for somebody who doesn't have hope and then you come and hear this message like, Hey, I know you've been told that you're nothing, that you're the scum of the earth and you can't get a job and people hate you and your ancestry is, is slavery and all of those things. And, and then you hear a message of hope. Now, listen, you're chosen. God loves you and you are the apple of God's eye. When you've been told that you're stupid, you'll never amount to anything, all that your whole life. And then you hear this message of hope and that, listen, they had it backward. You are actually special. God loves you, has a place for you. And so to see what that does for an individual at first, you know, at first, but then it just kind of like one of those things of what path, what path you take once you get in. You know, do you become dogmatic? Do you become hate, you know, uh, uh, hateful and bitter, which I would say the majority go that 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 route, at least 
from my experience. But there are a lot of loving, beautiful people. I see we have a mutual friend. Um, uh, uh, Zay, Zay, is that his name? Uh, the Christian rapper? Zay Doc, mm -hmm. Ben Israel. Oh, right. Right. So right. I had him on the show. And so there are some some people who who travel down that path and who have maintained their integrity and they don't have hatred and they're more inclusive than others, I would say. Mm hmm. Crazy. Okay. We got to have a great day of healing. You know, there's going to be a massive wave of healing that's going to have to come over everyone. And that's inevitable. And until then, we have to try to stay as sane as we possibly can. Yeah. For sure. Um, I got a couple more questions for you if you got time, man. Oh, I'm in. I'm in. I'm All right. So we, we had a, a message here a while ago, I guess, from, um, uh, you know, whether this is a, a definitely a Christian thing, especially I'm introducing psychedelics to a, to a Christian realm and have had my share of backlash. But even in the spiritual community, you hear that sometimes as psychedelics being a um, an easy way in a way to like not do the inner work and almost like cheating to get to these levels of, of bliss and some in and, and, and the person a while ago said counterfeit that that psychedelics could serve as a counterfeit to these levels of bliss through DMT. And we'll talk about that, too, uh, that psychedelics are a counterfeit and, and a way to kind of go around from doing the inner work and breath work and maintaining your diet. You know, all of these things that come along with accessing those kind of trance states and stuff. What do you what would your response be to someone who says that? Uh, and, and 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 maybe even people in the same vein who would say that that it's, a, it's something demonic, something that is mm. opening you up to demons because you're entering in through a false way. Right. I think I would tell someone like that's like being in a forest, you know, stranded with your friends, lost, and you don't have any water or anything, and you see it's raining, so you 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 take like a little plant, you know, and you and you put it like a little funnel shape, and you're drinking the water off there. And someone's like, that's not how water's supposed to be, guys. What 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 is not that's not how we interact with water. That's not I'm like, yeah, I know, but we're in survival mode right now. You don't understand. I'm like, we're we're gonna get to that water place you're talking about of how we normally drink water, but right now we're not there. So I would say in the future, um, for sure, there's not gonna be a need to open up our brain through the stimulation of plants because it's clear we can endogenously do it on our own naturally. Um but I do believe, based on what I learned from, from the Torah, from the biblical scripture, that the Israelites depended on the interaction with plants to achieve certain levels, um, as that means to keep the memory of it alive and to get to that place, to survive and get there. Um, you know, and you see God just telling Adam in the garden, all these plants and fruit bearing trees and all these things, that's for you to use, that's, that's for usage. Um, but at the time of Eden, you know, it was there was like one you shouldn't have used. And that's probably because he was there naturally. He didn't need it. But what we say it happened at the time of the Garden of Eden is that the light of Adam was sucked into the earth. It was sucked into the plants. That's something the Kabbalah teaches. And the purpose of the people of Israel was to do an extraction mission and bring it back out of the plants and back into the mind and reopen up humanity. So I would say that the light is in a hostage situation. It's stuck in the earth. And the the narrative of humanity is the extraction of the hostage to take it back out. And there will be a time where we, the light won't be stuck in the earth anymore and it'll be naturally in our brains. So for the people who are hopeful for that, stay hopeful, but don't let, don't, don't take other people out of their path to like recapture what was once lost, you know? Um, but even though that they're right in the future, we won't need to do that. So I just say those persons are living many years in the future and not being realistic about the survival struggle that we're going through right now. Or maybe even the, the study and the benefits of psychedelics and, 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 and the breakthrough that's that's happened for individuals who have done it and getting off of opiates and overcoming oh, a fear yeah. of death. And really the, the stories are endless when it comes to the research now. Just erasing neurological traumas, just, you know, getting over uh, people with depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts and like uh, eating disorders. And the list goes on and on and on. Don't take away medicine from people, you know, because and it's psychedelics is certainly not for everyone. If you like going to work and coming home and eating dinner and going to bed and waking up doing it again the next day and you're not complaining, we're not trying to ruffle your feathers. You on. carry on over there, you know, um, you know, it's not my job to take you out of your life and like show you the real world. Like now you don't know what to do and you can't go to work anymore because you want to, you know, I, I, I don't want to do that to anyone. But I think that 
Um, and I've had these debates with people about like, you got to put in the, and I do believe through the right breathing work, you could open up your uh, pineal gland and you could secrete DMT and you could heal all that stuff. But that information has been lost to us. Like, show me the guy today who's like, you know, there are healers out there and you read about him, you see him out there, but like you, you go do your job and help the whole world figure out what you're talking about and I'll sign, sign me up. But you know, don't be a keyboard warrior and sit at home and like tell people not to have access to something that the ancient people of Israel were doing to rectify sin of their ancestors. You know, if you look at the high priest of Israel, what was he doing in the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur on the Day of Atonement? He was going in there with plant extracts blended into a blend and hot coals. And the Torah says he stands in the room, puts the coals on the floor, puts the incense on the coals and the room bursts into a cloud of smoke. And the Jewish law was he had to wait for the whole entire room to become full with smoke before he could leave. And only at that moment was there atonement for the sin of Adam and Eve. So I'm like, let me tell that person who has this opinion, what do you think about the fact that he needed to inhale plant extracts to atone for a sin of Adam and Eve? Was he also cheating or hijacking the system? No, we believe that the light was hidden into the earth and now we're doing an extraction mission. And it's as simple as that. What about, um, well, I had a friend of mine, uh, Fred, this morning shared an article in our Discord that says, uh, it says, archaeologists find um, hash oh, residue yeah, I know this article. Sure. At, uh, at an ancient uh, Jewish temple and that they un uncovered an ancient Jewish temple and they're finding hash or cannabis uh, extract there. And, and kind of how that ties into, um, there was a... Uh, um, a a bomb or a uh, anointing oil that was created um, by the uh, ancient Israelites as well that most likely had cannabis in it and it would heal people? Um, okay, yeah, I mean, there's definitely something to that because first of all, we look at the anointing oil, the Sheman Hamishcha, and it says it had kanabozim in it, right? This is the famous Hebrew word, kanabozim, um, which is uh, explained by Rabbi Arya Kaplan and other great rabbis, likely the hemp and cannabis plant, where the etymology of cannabis comes from, is a verse in the in the in Exodus where it says, "Add cannabosum to this anointment." Um, and you and you see for sure that uh, not only that, you had cinnamon in in it mixed within it, and we know scientifically cinnamon opens up certain uh, uh, places in your body that are designed to block drugs. So it's like not only were they intentionally putting psychoactive chemicals in there, they were mixing in chemicals that like open the gateways for these things to just enter smoothly and come upon you. Um, so for sure. And, and also you see that the greatest Hasidic masters, the greatest rabbis of ancient Judaism all had a special pipe that after the Sabbath would come, they say we have to hit our pipe immediately to like console our soul and to like do rectifications in the spiritual world. So it's like inhaling smoke and plant extracts is almost such an integral part of the biblical story that if you don't want to accept that, you have your own precondition, pre, you know, preconceived notions that you're blocking your understanding of the basic scriptures from a basic understanding. So it would seem that for sure there was likely uh, this cannabis cannabosum and the anointing oil that they would put on themselves. But that was just one of a few things that would have unbelievable effects on different parts of your brain. And it wasn't even that because how and what they combined, we don't even know what effects it may have had on you. I was studying, I don't know if you saw this uh, author, Danny Nemu, Nemu, I forgot how to pronounce his last name. Um, he wrote a book about the science behind all these plants, literally the chemical uh, of, the, of the Torah, of the Bible, of the, of the anointing oil, the chemical makeup, the parts of your brain, the GABA receptors, the dopamine, what would have affected. And he shows you that it wasn't just the individual plant, it was how they all worked together. This plant would set this plant up for that, which that, and they, and it was like an all-star team. And you know what? We're impressed with ayahuasca in South America. You know, we go to the tribes out there, we say, how in the world did you guys know to combine MAO inhibitors with dimethyltryptamine to create this ayahuasca beer? You have millions of species of plants and to, to, to combine these specific two in this way to create this concoction, and they all have the same answer. They say that the plants told us, obviously. But, you know, that's impressive, combining two plants. What about the Israelites who would combine 11 plants? 
It's like, you know, there was some ancient technology there that I don't know, you know, where they got the information from outside of the divine realm to have known to combine these plants that do such specific things to the brain. And the last thing I'd want to say about the cannabis people is you look at the cannab cannabinoid receptors in the brain. Yeah. Let's say I find a, 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 a treasure chest with a lock on it. And then I find a key hidden and it was like my life's conquest i find and i'm like yo the key fits in the lock and someone's like no 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 no, it's not meant to do that bro and i'd be like what are you talking about this is a lock this is a key so if we have locks in our brain and then keys found throughout planet earth i'm not so interested in someone telling me those locks and keys don't fit together um let's let's figure out in what context they're meant to meant to you know fit together and what framework and learn about it from that understanding so I think there's just, you know, a lot of humility we need to take upon ourselves of we don't know. Like, I don't like when people come and say, this is this is bad. This is good. Bro, we don't we we don't know. It's our experiences <laughs> with it, man. You know what I'm saying? Somebody's had a bad experience. Like you said, that trauma, you know, they they got bit by a dog. And so now they don't like dogs, you know, and so they think every dog For is sure. the same as that one. So we like to project our experiences and as truth and as, you know, what I'm saying finality or or even on on god you know what i'm saying that okay yeah i don't like this is because god don't like this and we like to project and we come up with all these weird religions that we have now you know uh, i i'm very sympathetic for those people and i show compassion towards them and i don't judge and i love them but you know i also don't let them become intellectual bullies where they convince other people things so it's like i'm loving and sensitive to your traumas all the while until you try to put your trip on someone else and then we need, you know, we need people well, to step up. That's, can that's where we are with cancel culture and things. You know, there could be something that we say yeah. in this podcast and my whole YouTube gets deleted. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's just how where we are now. It's so weird. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that we're, we're in backwards land right now, you know? <laughs> upside um, down world. Yeah, yeah, we've gone completely upside down and backwards where, you know, it's funny because my wife was telling me the other day, she was like, you know what it says, um, learn about the people you can't criticize and then you'll learn about your masters, right? Yeah. And who do they who do they use that against? Where is that sent said about? It's said about the Jews, Israel and the Holocaust, right? Um, you know, if you can't criticize the Jews, you can't criticize Holocaust. Um, da, da, da. And all of a sudden it's like, yeah, that's because the Jews own you and that's why you can't. But uh, my wife's like, what do you mean? I can't openly talk about negative things about African-American people. Do they own me? Do they own the system? I can't say that this person, and this, I'm not even saying my personal beliefs. I'm just saying yeah. what I can't say. Yeah. I can't say that this person who identifies as a female actually is not a female and is literally a male playing a game calling herself female. I can't say that I'll get canceled. Do they own me? So it's like, no, it, it's so ridiculous to assume that the only people you can't criticize or talk about is the Jewish people of Israel. There's like a billion things in cancel culture you can't talk about right now. Mm -hmm. And um, and the fact is, you know, we're, you know, we've become not strong enough to handle uh, conversation and opinions. But at the same time, I don't know what it's like to be marginalized that that harshly and to be in a school where I'm made fun of because I identify as one thing and people I don't know that pain. So I'm sim obviously sympathetic for those people going through suffering. But I'm also not going to allow that suffering to get mixed into a new reality based on an insanity. <laughs> I'm with you, man. With you. Harry, man, I know there's a, a lot more places we can go, man. I really enjoyed this conversation. And, and uh, we have to do it again, bro. Thanks for coming on and, and hanging out with me. Hey, anytime. It. Listen, I appreciate the space to talk about this. Uh, my final notes, if I, would, if I see as we're going to the closing right now, I would say is uh, I found that on this show that you were from Native American tribes, um, original tribes. And in that regard, I have a tremendous amount of respect for you, uh, respect for them. I would love to dedicate some of my life work to hel helping reestablish, um, you know, reparations or whatever should come their way and fairness for them, at least the very least access to plant medicine without the law cracking down their yeah, shoulders. Yeah, for sure, for sure. You know, how many alcoholics are addicted uh, to alcohol and drugs Just in this ramp community? Rampant on, on um, reservations too. You know, imagine if we rolled out with the with the uh, ice cream truck serving ayahuasca to these people or whatever their you know the peyote or their indigenous they would they would want to look at alcohol again for the rest of the life once they re met the spirit ancestors that would come wake them up. So my love, my prayers go out to that community, um, to all communities suffering. I want to see a world of peace and love, 
Um, I don't have any tolerance for bullies, and uh, and you know, and that's that's where it comes down to. Good stuff. Go ahead and, and share your links and your website, your institution, everything you got. People want to know where they can find out more and they have questions for you. Cool. Thanks. I really appreciate it. Um, I tell a little bit of the timeline of myself, uh, that debate, the videos that I was talking about, some of the things I've done at rabbiharry.com, R-A-B-B-I-H-A-R-R-Y.com. Better to view it on a computer or a tablet because it's like a timeline. You like scroll through I like, I like how you set that up. It looks really cool. Oh, I appreciate that. It's, it was the easiest thing in the world. It was like a WordPress download that I just use like a spreadsheet <laughs> where I put in like events and a link and it just and populates it to yeah. the timeline. Yeah. So it was like zero coding involved. Um, Instagram, Rabbi Harry also. I post some really interesting little short snippets, what's going on in the world, updates of the spiritual realms. Um, feel free to reach out to me for a, for a for-profit living that I do because I have to, you know, I have a wife and kids. I got to feed somehow in this exile system. I run an online university called... Uh, Theological Research Institute, where I have courses in biblical studies. Um, you know, I have a course now on the Lost Tribes of Israel, if anyone wants to take. Um, my main website's mostly for Jewish people studying high-level Torah academics, but if you want to just get introductory courses, I have a website called wokecourses.com, um, where you can reach out to me from there to register and sign up for courses. And, uh, you know, I'm ha and if you don't have money, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Information comes first, and uh, let's see where it goes from there. Good stuff. Harry, man, thanks for coming on. Really enjoyed it, bro. Uh, it was great stuff. I appreciate it. We'll stay posted. Yes, sir. We'll do it again. Over and out. All right. Shalom. Peace. Shalom. Rabbi Harry. Enjoyed it, man. Good stuff. Covered a lot. Uh, good to, to talk about different uh, points of view and, uh, and opinions and, and life experiences with, with people that uh, come from si similar studies, man, and get different different opinions and, and backgrounds and um you know and the cool thing is where for me is when people who do have different backgrounds or have been raised differently or have studied differently and come to the same conclusions you know these universal truths that uh reign uh evident re regardless of of how you get there and there's some of those things and that's what we champion right and it's it's through love it's through acceptance it is through righteousness through gratitude and humility again when we go back to the plant teachers and plant medicines that's what they're communicating they are begging you to stay in the moment be present in that conversation be present in that that that, that trip that you're taking that car ride be in the moment jesus says be anxious for nothing make sure that do whatever you can to be present this thing is a, a, a blip it's here and it's gone and so we can measure that. We can look at it. Be present. Don't let any moment escape you, man. And and I guess, uh, you know, the, the plant medicines are big on that because they know how hard it is. And so even when you get into deep states of, of meditation, you know, when you get into deep states of meditation, it's the same thing that is communicated. Be present in the moment. Take care of your body. Your body is your temple. Um, eat better. Forgive. Like do all of these things. And so I find it really interesting that there was an interview on, on Mike Tyson's podcast uh, some time ago where uh, Eben Britton, he was a co-host with Mike Tyson, but he talked to someone about um, the stages that someone goes through on like a psilocybin journey, a plant medicine journey, and how it was tied to or similar to the journey of uh, going through the 12-step process. And if you go through the 12 steps, let me just pull it up here while, while I'm mentioning it. Um, let's see. Because I've never been through it. Um, but I have friends who, uh, who have, and they have um, really benefited from it. And then I also know people who, religious people who talk down on it, you know. But, and see how, how um, similar it is. But there's this place of faith and surrender, soul searching, integrity, acceptance, humility, willingness. And Eben Britton was talking about the process that we go through on psilocybin encounter. And you literally go through those steps. You go through those steps of, of surrender of, okay, you try to fight that process, but then you got to surrender to it. It's going to take you, it's going to pull you and show you some things that may seem uncomfortable. And then when you do that, there's this place of deep soul searching where you got to look within and come to grips with who you are 
come to grips with eternity. What happens if you, when you die, what happens if you die right now? Fear, all of these things, are you okay with it? And just going through that process. And so I find that really interesting that the healing that comes from that and people who have gone through the 12, 12 step, step process and have received healing and people who have gone on shamanic journeys with plant medicines and forsaken everything and gone to Peru or whatever that they've done to, to do that, that ceremony. And it's radically changed their lives for the better. And so I believe that every good and perfect gift comes from above, whether that be the 12 step program, whether that be a psilocybin journey, whether that be counseling or whatever, every good and perfect gift comes from the father of lights. Um, and when we look at the 12 step programs, we see that that actually came through that process. The founder of that got the process through LSD experience, a deep LSD encounter that he came back with the 12 steps on how to deal and process your own emotions and thoughts and listen, whatever it takes, man, you know, whatever you need. And, um, and th there's many different paths to, to healing. And, and I champion all of them. So thank you guys for, for hanging out with me. I'm reading the chat here. I've been reading it the whole time, man. You guys are awesome. Thanks for being a part of this live stream. Um, shout out to everybody listening. Um, but yeah, it is it is an interesting topic. And there are, uh, there's a lot to say on it. Um, I was asked to uh, I was asked to go on Kingdom Talks and, and maybe debate somebody about um, about this, about um, plant medicines in, in the Bible or plant medicines. And if we should, the pros and cons and, and all, all of those things. And, and I, I told the person who reached out to me, I told him, I don't think it would be a good idea. It's something that you have to experience. It's something that you have to do the research. The research is there of the benefits of it. And I guarantee that they far outweigh any consequence, um, of set and setting and, and, and taking this medicine, but as far as trying to convince someone that it is something that you should do or other people should do, I think that it comes down to each individual. Uh, I don't. I think it is the sick who need a doctor. You know, it's it's somebody who who needs medicine who is uh, struggling. There are people who don't need it, but there are definitely people that it can change their life and it can help them. Um, and it serves many different purposes as well. I'll say that. So I wasn't interested in trying to convince you to do this. I'm convinced myself that I needed to, and it, it radically changed my life, launched me into my destiny to do what I'm doing f for a living. My heart's desire gave me a game plan and a map on how to manifest it and how to, and how to live my best life uh, through communion with God and the angels and the spirits that be. And you're guided by this white light of the, of the Holy Spirit, as I would call it. And it really plays a lot into your religious affiliation and your religious beliefs. So all of that just kind of bleeds into everything that we do and the way that we perceive the world and experiences and, and whether that good, that's good experiences, bad experiences. Heck, we talked about today on how that how you judge other people, how you judge people of a different skin color, how your religious experiences um, play into that and pour over. And so. Uh, Isaiah says, I found Third Eye Indigo on your channel and got connected in real life. That's what's up, man. Shout out. Um, shout out to everybody hanging out. I'm reading these comments here. Great words and knowledge today. Stay woke, truth seekers, for sure. Stay woke. Jesus looks at our heart. Yeah, man, for sure. And um, he gives us a new heart, too. That's one of the beautiful things about um, the Holy Spirit and, and the Christian experience is surrendering to um, love, which is Jesus is love that became a person, right? So surrendering to love and allowing love to examine your heart, take away your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And so that experience of regeneration, um, giving you a new mind, giving you a new heart. And there are many different ways to, to get to and experience that love. And that's the beautiful thing. And, um, and I do find it that we need to resonate with the things that, that, that we're into versus going out trying to proselytize and convince someone. Um, obviously, we just have conversations and let the chips fall where they may. And, uh, and people believe things because of religious programming, through indoctrination, through watching television, through so much stuff, through your own experiences that may have been good or bad with individuals. 
again, going back to the, the dog analogy and, and someone having trauma because of they, uh, getting bit by a dog. And now when they hear a dog barking, they get scared because they know dogs bite. You know, it's for someone who's went out and pet, pet a dog and, uh, and the dog bites them. But hey, you're the first person that dog's ever, ever bit. You know, he don't bite. He's like, no, that dog bites. At least he bit me. That's my experience. So, and I'm sticking with it. So, uh, yeah, and I enjoyed it. Enjoyed these conversations. Enjoyed these talks. We got so much that we're working on, guys, uh, with the Mystic Circle and and bringing on different creators and and healers and and um, just some beautiful people within the community who have so much to offer. And I'm excited to launch the the new podcast, which is the Mystic Circle podcast. That's going to be coming out very soon. Um, it's going to be a roundtable, most likely four people. Who knows? We could have more. We'll, we'll be uh, addressing some of these subjects and getting other people's takes and just going uh, in them and seeing where they go, man. We're going to be talking about the paranormal, the supernatural, the spirit world, aliens, angels, the occult, religion, all of it. Mysticism. We're going in. So if you want to be a part of that and if you have something to offer and something to give, reach out to me, man, because uh, we're definitely looking for uh, like minded individuals who have something to offer, especially in, in the way of content or starting a podcast or something like that as well. We have the ability to to host all of that stuff. So we're going to be doing events, webinars. Um, I'm doing a Sunday morning breathwork session every Sunday. Um, we just started it last week. It was phenomenal. Uh, the recording is up at the mystic as well. You can sign up for right now, a seven day free trial, or you get access to everything, the back end, the social media, everything that we have for the members. So check it out. The mystic circle.net. Um, working on so much. I'm working on an album as well. Um, I'm about, about about 10 songs in about 10 songs in on a, on a new album. And, um, and then there's some extra like cover songs as well. I just have to figure out if they're going to be like bonus songs or maybe a whole cover album or cover EP that I'm going to put out, but I'm about 10 songs in, um, got to finish up a couple, but there's definitely a new album coming very soon. It's been, it's been a while since I put one out. I didn't do anything. I didn't put out anything last year, but if you're a patron, You've been listening to the new music all last year. And there's some songs that uh that really ring true and really near and dear to my heart that uh we put out. I just really sonically love the uh the sound of Astral Plane and DMT and Breathe and some of these other uh spiritual esoteric hip hop songs that I've been working on. So yep, all that's gonna be available here soon. Uh if you're a patron, you get you get um access to it all. Uh, ZM DMZ says, have you heard anything on Jordan Maxwell yet? Yeah, I've been talking to Jordan. Um, hmm. I don't know what I should say. Um, you know, I, Jordan's doing better as you know what I'm saying? As far as health wise or whatever. But if you let him tell it, he's not, not doing that well. He's just getting old. Um, so, uh, we're going to be working together. I don't know if we're going to do any podcasts, but we're going to be working on some exclusive videos. Um, that will be available at the mystic circle. Um, it's going to be exclusive membership stuff. There's going to be some documentaries and things like that, that we're working on some original, um, presentations that we're doing. And I'm talking to Jordan about, uh, doing some stuff as well. So I have talked to Jordan. He is doing better, but you know, if you let Jordan tell it, he's just grumpy Jordan. <laughs> so that's just kind of what it is always. Uh, and so a lot of people sent in, um, you know, when I did that video, just kind of an update for Jordan, a lot of people sent in uh, voice recordings and I played a couple of them for Jordan and he was really moved. And so I don't know if we'll do an interview. Maybe we will. Who knows? Um, it's it's on the on the table, but I, I, I hate to say it, but I don't know. I mean, I, I, I have a bunch of interviews with Jordan already and I don't think you're going to hear anything new in the interviews. So I definitely would say go check out like I got four interviews with them. So go check out those. But moreover, check out a lot of Jordan's older stuff. Check out Jordan's stuff from the 80s and 90s and, and early 2000s. Those interviews and some of the stories that he shared that he really doesn't share out anymore. Um, you're not going to get those anymore. So go listen to Jordan's, Jordan's um, early stuff. So it'll um, inspire you. And that's what inspired me to, to want to talk to him and do what I'm doing. Baked Brain says, y'all should make cartoons for kids. That's what spirit science is doing. Jordan River 
with Spirit Science, and I've talked to him about collaborating and, and maybe having me in an episode or at least some of my material. And so we've talked about it, and uh, I sent him a script. He's definitely been covering some more religious themes in, in his stuff lately, but whether it'll be some of my topics or me in it or anything like that, I don't know. But Spirit Science is doing a great job at um, bringing out the cartoons and stuff. Him, as well as um, Hans, um, who was it, uh, Hans forgot his last name it's with the uh, the life explained.com i had him on the podcast a couple of weeks ago uh, and uh what he's doing with with his illustrations um or something that 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 kids could could grasp as well and he's also doing children's books and children's animations as well about these really deep concepts of the akashic and angels and life to, life after after death and all of these things in in this beautiful um illustration so i guess that's what I'm wanting to do with uh with the mystic circle is creating original content we're gonna um do you know take a podcast like this and a lot of information and just put it into um an explainer video that that has visuals as well so there'll there'll be animations and and all that kind of stuff that really help explain it just than just staring at someone's face for two hours i mean that's um that's a, a long form conversation that a lot of people like but I, I've noticed with my my content the 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 uh, my music that I put out that has a visual do a lot better and go a lot further. The um, um, presentations that I do, the Christ consciousness one, the third eye in the Bible, all of those they 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 get a lot more traction because people stay on them longer because you have things coming in and switching and all that kind of stuff. So moving forward, we, we're going to be working on some documentary stuff and some presentation stuff. Literally. Um, I have someone coming down this weekend, the Gothic mystic, and we're going to be working on a presentation and going in on, on demons and, and spirits and angels and those things. So we'll be putting out a, a documentary on that. So send light and love and prayers our way for that, that whole thing. And that, that comes out good, but got a lot of, um, interesting stuff coming down the pipeline and, uh, we just got to find the time and, and the creative outlets to, to get it out. I've been writing a lot. Um, been going in in meditation and prayer for myself and getting a lot of info. So I've been trying to articulate it. John Santiago says, uh, interested on that new podcast, D. For sure, man. Heck yeah. Um, working on the intro now. I just got the intro back from the voiceover and stuff. And so once we find a date and time that we can do it, my podcast, I'm booked up like until April. So I don't know about like adding another podcast date that'll be doing like three podcasts a week or something i may um if i can find time but heck with this kind of thing i don't even have to uh be a part of it i don't even have to be a part of it you know with the with the mystic circle we can just have four mystics go at it and just throw the uh different um uh topics out there so alex you, you're bringing up some cool points man i'm gonna touch on these points real quick so first of all you say True seeker, hey, question here. Is Jesus and Christ two different things? For instance, Christ like an oil crystal slips in your body. Um, no, I think they're the same thing. I do, you know, because of my experiences, because of my study. Um, so Jesus, I, I don't think that there is Christ without Jesus Christ. And so, um, but but as far as the oil and 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 what Christ represents in that oil, that Christos, yes, is definitely and oil and the oil is 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 uh representative of a lot of different things in the old testament spiritually uh it talks about the oil of joy the oil of gladness and so jesus definitely in that christ spirit represents joy and gladness and, and hope and and those things so a lot of that stuff is symbolic right so you know it's jesus literal oil that secretes up the spine and releases listen when you do those breath breathwork techniques and you tap into uh, the, the higher realms through light and through love, which which is the currency of that realm. Um, you tap into light and love when you go within and you uh, shut down the external world. The more that you stay focused on this external world, the more you get into rules and regulations and religions and do's and don'ts and and all of that kind of thing. And so that's why we need to continually go within and, and humble ourselves and, and seek what we are called God and, and seek Christ in those realms. So. That's a little bit on that. Um, let's see here. I'm going to read some more. Uh, Santiago says, if you're looking for people to fill in. Yeah, man. Love to have you. I'm talking about to get you on an alien show, bro. For sure. Get you on them aliens. Um, 
And Alex also says, I like the song with Jelly, Jelly Roll. It's pretty good. Thank you. Yeah, that's one of my favorites. That's one of my favorite verses. Obviously, working with Jelly Roll, I knew I had to bring it. And, uh, and well, it was like the, the way I wrote it and the cadence and all of that, but really even saying some deep stuff in that song. So I wanted to make sure that I, um, that it came across. And it's one of my favorite songs and my favorite, one of my favorite verses for sure. If you haven't heard it, look up the song me and Jelly Roll did together. Um, and then Alex, you also say, this is what I want to comment on. Uh, you say, have you heard of Destiny Lab? I have heard of Destiny Lab. I know we have a lot of um, overlapping audience. Uh, a lot of people who listen to my work, listen to them. And, uh, and I think even with Lost Children of Babylon, LCOB, they uh, resonate with them a lot. Um, Destiny Lab. I didn't, and I'll just be honest, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell the, the, the guy that. Um, let me see one. But but to, to to go back, I have um Ark from Destiny Lab is gonna be on the True Seeker Podcast. Um he's gonna be on it's in April. April the eighth, Ark from Destiny Lab will be on the podcast. He is a guest. It's coming up in April. But um I didn't really get into Destiny Lab's music for many reasons. I mean, you know, and I'll say it, it's just my opinion. First of all, I thought a lot of it was a ripoff of L C O B. Not even a compliment, but a ripoff because I've just some of the the thought the things that LCLB brought to the table stylistically and the way that one of my favorite rappers, Richard Raw, aka Tahuti Most, the way he raps and what he does with his voice, it is so unique. And then to hear people in the in Destiny Lab like try to copy that. Um, I didn't really like that too much. And then a lot of the stuff we're talking about with the aliens and angels and spirit beings and all of that kind of stuff with psilocybin journeys and stuff they would call it demonic because i think that they take a really far right stance on christianity with their music and even though i'm a christian and, and i do too um i'm i'm more open to uh explore those realms and i've had experiences that um that stuff would just kind of like close the door or um shut the lock and key on so uh, i would want to get into him uh, into discussion with him and i'll, I'll say that and and get his take, not to call him out, but to say, hey, this is what I feel. So I'm looking forward to that discussion um, with with Ark from Destiny Lab. So I know we have a lot of overlapping fa audience and fan base, and it's been a, we haven't really, I've never connected with them and never really been into their music. But um, but maybe so. Who knows what the future holds, man? Maybe we'll do some stuff together for sure. Paul says he used to box with Jelly. That's what's up, man. And shalom, shalom. Uh, uh, Cyblix Hunter, X Hunter says, living in the heart to get closer to God. That's what it is. Living in the heart space. We say from the heart up, from the heart, being able to speak your truth, accessing the third eye, being able to have the mind of Christ, renewing your mind to, again, access heavenly states to leave your body. From the heart up and you want to have everything balanced in all area you want your diet you want your the, your um you know sexual um desires and all of those things just to be balanced and be put in check and, and not let anything be out of balance or rule over you the key is balance we were looking up uh on our i have a, a, a program that i lead on sunday nights with the path of the healer and we were uh, we're talking about happiness and, and imagine, a, imagine a life where your default setting was happy. And one of the guys was like, man, that seems so far out of reach. You know, my default setting would be happy. And so if that's your if that's out of reach, then maybe your default setting is worry. Maybe your default setting is is um, anxiety, you know, but imagine a lot a timeline or a life where your default setting is happy. And I just went to the scriptures to to look up what that word means, you know, happy. And it, the Bible says, like, happy is he is the man who receives correction from the Lord. Like uh, one of the, the definitions of, of happy in the Hebrew actually means balance to level being balanced and that you'll be happy if you're balanced. You're not too far right. You're not too far left. You are just in that highway of holiness. The Bible calls it. It also calls it this, the 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 narrow path. It's the middle. It's not even in politics. It's not far right or far left. Those aren't the answers. The truth is right in the middle. So finding happiness in the balance. So I thought that that was deep. Alex says, I love Lost Children of Babylon. 
Okay. With that being said, um, um, Rasul Allah from LCOB is supposed to be on a new album. So he has a track. He's working on it. And so hopefully we'll get that back uh, soon. And so that'll be on a new album. Um, and so, yeah, you say Alex says I'll be be there April 8th to tune in for sure. For sure. Thought W99 says, uh, have you ever heard of Illuminati Congo? And what's your take? Would love to hear your take. Um, my philosophy on Illuminati Congo is I like to say his name as much as I can. Um, as far as a, a hip hop artist, he is amazing. Um, as far as work ethic, Im impeccable. Um, I've sent him song. We, we have a lot of music together. Um, we've sent him songs and features where he'll, man, he'll knock it out the same day and just turn around and send it right back. Like we send him a verse and other people, three months, six months, a year. Like we've had a lot of bad business when it comes to working on music. Luminati Congo, same day, next day, three days at the most. Like he ain't going to let all this stuff stack up on him. That guy, he just receiving that info, the, the knowledge and information. And he can, some of the, I mean, the most prolific verses I've ever heard in my life from Illuminati Congo have been turned around the next day. And so I, I love that brother. I try to mention his name as much as I can. Um, he was my uh, uh, introduction into breath work. So everything that I do and I teach people when it comes to breath work and I champion breath work and how popular it's getting, um, I give you know mad respect that that Illuminati Congo, um, you know, was my doorway into the beauty of adding breath work to meditation. I didn't know about it, you know, in the um, you know, early, early 2010s or whatever. Um, it wasn't to our relationship. And I would, um, we used to, we used to do conferences and I've done maybe three or four where we've hired Illuminati Congo to do Skype sessions with us and me and a group of people, uh, at a conference that we did, um, a men's retreat. We, we done one men's retreat and, and I Skyped in Illuminati Congo to do breath work. And, um, I can't say enough about Illuminati Congo. I love them. I love that brother to death. And so that's my take on him. Tell him I said it. Let it make him come listen to this. Tag him in this podcast. Um, uh, Samurai says, did I miss the majority of the podcast? Yeah, we're two hours in. And uh, so, yeah. Samurai also says, yes, living in Christ consciousness. Just try to do your the best for yourself and everyone around you. That's it. Walking in the consciousness of Christ, you know. And it also says, like, what matter of love is there? Like, there, there is no greater um, form of respect. There is no greater love than a man that would l lay down his life for his friends, you know. And people say, would you take a bullet for your homie? Would you die for your friends? And it's like, understanding that's what he did, you know. So, definitely Christ consciousness, walking in the consciousness of Christ. Son of Lamech says, peace from scribes of Avalon. Shout out, shout out. As above, so below. I see that. From the heart up, not the heart down. Um, I don't know. Is it you? Are you a hip hop group or what is it, what is the Scribes of Avalon? Let me look it up. I'm seeing a lot of gaming stuff. Wolfbane the Poacher is that something? Scribes of Avalon is that a, a music or something? If you believe it's gonna come. Feeling heavy from the hatred and I cannot wait The you? truth I see but only thin me through a curtain of lies I've seen enough to know that we're in for a nasty surprise Flips and ignorance you walk around with scars on your face The plans you know not of that will wipe out the human race okay, Stick to the path and the material like being it. it won't last Like a good creation nation we no longer have the I like it, if that's you, I don't know I'm just trying to look it up and see For sure Um, Some more Are you going to do uh, Baked Brains, are you going to do anything new with the red face movement? I don't know who that is. Um, red face movement, I'm not sure. Is that, I'm assuming that's like Tribe of Red, maybe? The uh, Native American, like, EDM, industrial type music they make? Tribe of Red, I know who that is. Uh, Cyblick says, hitting weed, it's all right. 
same day productivity is a key for daily results for sure man for sure like putting stuff off um procrastination is is of the devil <laughs> for sure like you don't want to procrastinate my big thing is like i've got a lot of stuff i've been sitting on and i just i can't um there's so many ways to to tell the story i'll say that whether it comes out in a song whether it comes out in a course a teaching um, a podcast that we just talk about it nonchalantly um, or if it, well, however it goes. So I have a lot of stuff that I've I've written and worked on that trying to figure out the best way to share it, that it gets the most, um, has the most impact and reaches the most amount of people, uh, especially with algorithms and stuff. And it's just really, really hard. And, and that, that really pre prevents me, but I want to be productive as far as getting it out of me, articulating it. So that's a big one. Um, breathing is the voice of life. Yes, yes. So, so somebody says Anahata is awesome. Thank you, thank you. I don't know if you're talking about my song um, Anahata, but they have a, an album called um, Anahata Sacred Sound Current as well. So, but yeah, they're both off awesome. <laughs> oh, and this is, and so Thought says uh, thank you. Forgot that he was in the video of I Am. You two are my light. I love you, brothers. You both so, show me so much love. I am so full of joy uh, that I got to hear uh, my thanks for sure. Yeah, yeah. He's at the beginning. And I, and I had him singing the intro by himself in the video. I just put him. So he, he showed up in the uh, in the intro. OK, so Baked Brain says, I guess some of the, the, the uh, red face movement you're talking about, Jay Payne. No, we, we're not set to do anything. We've done our feature um, several years ago. I did a feature on his album. But I haven't talked to him in a while. And he's been on the podcast, so we haven't checked that out. So, um, Alex says, could I have your insight on the Gnostic text? And do you think it's true or blasphemous? Uh, I wrote a blog on it. If you go to truthseeker.com, click articles. And it said, it literally says, should I read the Gnostic Gospels? And, but to save you some time, also you should go read it. But I'm not, I'm not with them. I'm not with the Gnostic texts. I'm not with a lot of Gnostic uh, doctrines. Uh, I like Gnosis. I like some of the, the things that it uh, brings to the table uh, with the Essenes. And th there's a lot of weird stuff. So to, you know, to, to co-sign with like something like that or, you know, you kind of, hell, I would probably say the same thing about the Bible. Like there's some stuff or just interpretations that I don't resonate with that have been changed or the ideas have been changed that I don't res resonate with either. So, but I think that they're forgeries. I think that they're fake. I don't think that they were written, you know, even when I, I was scrutinized some of that, I don't think that Thomas wrote the gospel of Thomas. I don't think that Mary Magdalene wrote the book of Mary. Like, I don't think that these people wrote those books. I think other people have, have written those to kind of throw a wrench in the system. They, they, they just don't feel right. And I, and, but there are texts that were taken out. There are some, some, um, apocryphal text that that really do i feel like keep with the spirit and the essence of the scriptures man of that light and of that journey that that really feel good reading them like you feel like okay this isn't a forgery a lot of that stuff you'll read it and you're like hold on you're trying too hard so i say that with the gnostic texts and the gnostic gospels but i also say that about one of the big ones which i wish it was true but it's not which is the uh, the Urantia book, if anybody's heard heard of that. But it goes into about Melchizedek and Jesus and angels and a bunch of weird stuff. But like for me being a seeker and, and being into woo woo stuff, you know, the spiritual side of, of our faith and things like I would want it to be real. But the way it reads. They were trying too hard. They they uh, use so many adjectives before they explain something. Like instead of saying, and Jesus was the third born of so-and-so before they mention Jesus, they'll, they'll like say all of these things about him, and, and they just keep doing it. You know, they, for Melchizedek, for everything that they mention, it just reads so weird and, uh, and just the spirit behind it, you know, it's really hard. It's really hard to, to take it seriously for me anyway, you know, have you heard of the second discourse, discourse of great Seth? I have not. And if you have, what's your opinion? I've not heard that. Don't know what that is. I have to check it out, though. 
And so uh, there's a bunch of these books that I don't know. And so Beloved Disciple says, uh, my favorite uh, my favorite are Ig Ignatius Epistles. Uh, I wish Christians knew about his work. Uh, Apostle John's Disciple. Interesting. I have to check it out. I don't know much about it. Um, you know, one of my favorites is the Clementine homilies, which is from the um, the book of Clement or the recognitions of Clement, who was a disciple of Barnabas. And there's a lot of spiritual, a lot of far out stuff in there, especially when it comes to a subject very near and dear to my heart, which is the spirit realm and demons and how they get access to the human body. And it's through eating lots of meat and gorging yourself on food and, and different things, how demons get access to the physical body. Uh, I, I used a lot of that in my book. I, I, I cited it, but um, a lot of interesting stuff in the recognitions of Clement, which can be found on uh, online. And um, yeah, you can get that. That's a good one. And thought says, oh yes, in your book connected so many truths for me. Your faith in Jesus has helped me not get lost from Christ as if that could ever happen. Yeah, you'd be surprised, man. But hopefully, you know, if you ever get lost, you find your way back. And uh, and that's definitely what I champion, at least for um, that, that relationship with Christ and the inner light and God and the universe. And not just with that, but knowing who you are in Christ allows you to know who you are in relationship to other beings, whether those be angels or demons or naysayers or friends or foes um just to kind of know who you are to stand in your truth which is light which is love and jesus is the greatest expression of that that could ever exist and that we can encounter that it lives within us he lives within us it is love it is ever present uh to us as a, in our time of need it does never leave us or never forsake us and can never do anything to undo that and that's the greatest scandal the greatest story ever told and um, it's the very thing that they want to keep you away from because we can sell you different things outside of that. When you understand that the kingdom of heaven is within you and you don't need anything outside of yourself to tap into God's love and who you are and expression and acceptance. Listen, we can't sell you nothing. We can't package it. And so everybody and everything has to have a gimmick. You know, they got to have their thing or their packaging or whatever. But that message is so is so uh, pure that they can't, you know, they're trying to to uh, destroy it. Julian says, hey, love your work and just wanted to know what advice you'd give to someone seeking the truth in spirituality and where to start like a guideline. If I was to give someone just, okay, a place to start. Um, meditation, breath work, contemplation. I mean, those are kind of the same things. Um, as I always say, reading, find you some good material to read, whether it's a good book. Um, for me, it's definitely the Bible, but there's also other books outside of that. Um, reading, prayer, meditation, which is that contemplation, and listening to good music. Listening to good music. It, it's, it's, I find it so weird whenever um, I see a lot of people listening to like like derogatory music and stuff. And I, I, I listen to some of it like stylistically um, as far as like, you know, what's popular in the culture or whatever. But as far as like listening to WAP or some of this stuff, like it's so weird. But garbage in garbage out so i guess in that in that contemplation you're sitting in a place of receiving as well as you're doing that inner contemplation and receiving of the heavenly energies and coming to terms with who you are you're receiving so garbage in garbage out receive the reflection that you're reading in these beautiful books and um and then go go within to receive that way in prayer meditation and breath work and also the music the documentaries and the things that you're you're watching all of that stuff stirs you up all of that stuff creates a uh, expectation within you of what is possible and, um, and and allows you to experience it and stuff that you've never even seen or heard for before these concepts begin to tap into this realm of synchronicity where they just keep showing themselves to you. So that's the beautiful thing when stuff starts piggybacking off of one another and the synchronicities show up in the signs and something that I said you read in a book and then you hear it in a song and then it's just like, hey, I'm going deeper into this. And then you know that you're not alone, that the universe, that God knows your name and uh, and knows every thought that you would ever think. And uh, and that is when it gets gets really good and you just start following those breadcrumbs from the creator. So those three things, you know, whether it's a book like I can give you books. I wrote a book. Check out my book. You can go to Amazon. Just type in True Seeker. It's called Spirit Realm. 
Um, and that's that covers a lot of subjects for sure. So back to the comments. Got fed to the lions. Okay, you said uh, Saint um, Ignitus. Dude, the saints and, and the mystic and, sa and sages of old, man, they they had a lot of wisdom, and it's um, and they were definitely mystics, you know. So we definitely need to go back and and, and read some of those first works, for sure. Um, Alex says when you do check it out, looking forward to hearing your opinion on it. Awesome. Sons of Lamech says the only blasphemy is if the text snatches your mind and makes you think you're better than anyone else. Um, I know good people that learn from all texts from all time and bad people who did the same. Exactly. Exactly. Cause like I posted a scripture the other day from, I think it was Luke or Mark. It's, it's reiterated in the other gospels, but it says that the uh, evil man out of the evil of his heart will bring forth that which is evil. And the good man out of the goodness of his heart will bring forth that which is good. Whatever's within you is going to come out, you know, whether that's in, in, in music, uh, whether that's in your writings. So that evil person could read the scriptures with evil intent and, and see evil things and see separatism and all that. But someone else sees it with a, with a different eye, a trained eye, a third eye, and they could see beauty, beauty in it. They see beauty in all things and all beings and all people. And so uh, the Bible says to the pure, all things are pure. I really believe that. So that's why we need to work on our purity and don't let nothing snatch that from you. Um, for sure. Uh, peace from the, and love from the scribes of Avalon. Thanks for the information. You're welcome. Um, okay. And so, uh, D three Martin says the song from your colors album. So thank you. Yeah, that's my, um, Oh, let me fix my video. 